Hey, hey, welcome to Gas Mass and Hand Grades. I am your host, Jeff. Today is a really special day as I welcome one of my favorite artists ever onto the show. I first became aware of her back in probably late 2003, maybe 2004, uh, simply by sampling some of those old 30-second MP3s that you would find on early distros. And this one was uh, on the Aquarius Records distro out in San Francisco, RIP. They, they went out of business quite a while ago, but I um, got hair in my mouth. Um, listen to some of the sound samples on there on the web page and of her first album, her debut album called Ballads of Living and Dying. And the song 55 Falls just absolutely floored me. It just was ghostly, haunting, finger-picked guitar melodies and her ethereal spectral vocals and harmonies were just captivating. I followed her religiously through her first three albums. Then my life got kind of weird and I had a lot of stuff going on. And I kind of missed out on the next two albums and an EP and some cover albums and whatnot. And um, I came back to her career in 2014 with the release of her sixth album, July. And reconnecting with that was a pretty amazing experience because I was really blown away by the complexity of her songwriting the musicianship and the lyricism and just how she had developed her overall style and sound. I, I fell in love with that album and I've stayed mostly current with all that she's been doing up to since then, culminating most recently with the amazingly dense and gorgeous, the path of the clouds, which came out in 2021 and the accompanying EP, the wrath of the clouds, which came out in 2022. Since I don't have her for an exhaustive four hour interview, uh, we're going to get right into it. So please welcome the enchantingly wonderful Sean Toos of Ethereal Melancholic Dream Doom, Maris, Dream Doom, Marissa Nather. And I promise you, I know you hate a lot of those adjectives because you hear them in every review. I'm going to promise. I'll try not to use them, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to break that promise. So how are you, Marissa? I'm pretty good. How about you? I'm hanging in there. We had a little bit of stress getting started here. I had some microphone uh, wonkiness on my end. I always tell my guests, come in about 10 minutes early so we can figure out if there's any gremlins. And of course, this time the problem was on my end. So I apologize for being a little late. Um, but uh, so again, I want to apologize to you up front for using all those same old words like haunting, ghostly, gothic, doomy, dreary, ethereal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I know you're probably so sick of those same old adjectives. But for me, they really, really are effectively accurate and in, uh, in describing your, your music and your style of music. And frankly, they're said in complete reverence. So mea culpa if I screw that up and use those words a lot in the, in the, in the rest of the interview. But uh, so how have you been and how's the weather been down there? It's been pretty mild uh, up here in Pennsylvania. How's it been in Nashville? It's been uh, unseasonably warm strange yeah and like it's like there's flowers on the trees already oh wow and very weird weather global warming is a real thing oh yeah for sure for sure you've been down there how long have you been down there a couple of years now yeah okay and you moved from boston um i don't know if you remember when we were talking on instagram a little bit earlier about a week ago or so uh my daughter went to school down there in murfreesboro she went to middle tennessee state Oh, yeah. That's so I've been down to, to Tennessee, and I have another reason why I like Nashville so much. I am a dreaded Tennessee Titans fan, and yeah. I've, I've felt the pain year after year after year. But we traveled down, my son and I, we traveled down in 09 to see a Titans game that we lost, of course, because we were there. And uh, then we've, we helped my daughter move and stuff like that. And Nashville is such a killer town. It's just so cool there, I think. Yeah, I mean, I have um, not really gotten to know it yet, cause just because um, I moved right where the pandemic started. So, um, and I'm a little bit of a in um, insular person, but yeah, oh, yeah, it's it's nice. Like, it's more mellow. It's just like more like a town feel, small town feel. You know? So you don't you don't get out much to the you know like Beale Street and all that stuff like that, or. I'm kind of uh, always working on my, like, I, I don't actually know, but I mean, I've been out a few times down to the, 
honky tonks and honky tonk. stuff like that. Some didn't concerts. go check out all the cool guitar stores down there. Like yes, uh, I yeah. actually gotta do I that. Love right? guitar stores. Of course. I forget the one. What's the one that's uh, is it Grunz? Grunz? Yeah. Is that the one? Groon, yeah. Groon or something? Groon. Yeah. Yeah. We went down there when we were down and they had like ridiculously, you know, expensive like pre World War II D 45s, like Martin D 45s that were like, you know, 200 grand. <laughs> yeah. Look at those guitars going, oh God, if only I was rich, but I'm not. So, you know. Now, you're a tailor. Are you a tailor person? Actually, um, I'm up. I mean, I like the first acoustic, nice acoustic I have had. It was a tailor, like um, that I glued back together many times and still use that. It's um, and then I have a Martin twelve string. Okay. Um, but then I'm really playing a lot of PRS these PRS. days because they endorse me. So I and I like that they're a small company um, and handmade and. So I do the um, hollow bodied acoustic. It's not. A, it's a hollow body. Semi electric. hollow body, yeah. And a twelve string electric from PRS. Um, have you been to the plant down in Stevensville? I haven't actually. Oh, it's so cool. A um, bunch of years ago, I want to say probably like two thousand five or six. Um, I I got invited because two of my buddies, one John Wesley and Steve Steve Wilson, who I think I talked to you about. We'll get to that in a little bit, a little bit later. But uh, Porcupine Tree, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but Stephen Wilson. So they're buddies of mine, and I work kind of did a lot of stuff for the band and their management back in the night from '99 to 2010. And I got invited to the plant for like a, a special, and like Carlos Santana's walking around, and Mickey Moody, and all these like rock stars. And I'm like, uh, okay, just keep it cool, man. <laughs> you know, it was it was so cool, but. I actually owned a PRS. I had to sell it. Unfortunately, I had a custom 22. I love that guitar. Nothing hurt me worse than getting rid of that in my D28. That was painful, but I had to survive. So, well, look, let's get into let's get into the uh, things so I don't keep you here all day. Um, just a quick note before we get started on the interview, we are going to have a special guest that's going to be joining us uh, at some point in time. It's going to be super exciting, but it's super mysterious. Okay, so don't say anything, Marissa. Okay. okay. She knows who's coming on. So uh, tell me a little bit about your first memories of music and how that early exposure to the music kind of affected you. And in addition to that, do you have any special memories of like specific artists or bands or songs that associate with like really deep rooted memories in your early life? You know, for me, for example, Simon and Garfunkel's Bridge Over Troubled Water. Oh, my God. What a beautiful, amazing album. Uh, so, uh, James Taylor, Sweet Baby James, Carol King, Tapestry. Those are the three albums I remember my mom playing all the time in my very early years. Do you have any experiences like that? What can you tell me? Yeah. Um, my parents had a really good record collection and kind of hip, hippies. So I <clears throat> grew up on a lot of classic rock. Like they liked Pink Floyd and Yes and a lot of prog rock, weirdly. I mean, and we're going to concerts. Like we, they took me to see um, Jethro Tull and Procol Harum was my first concert that I ever oh went goodness. to at Great Woods in Boston. And um, like, so they were cool. And my older brother was in a like a jam band in high school. And so he was uh, like the one that kind of got me um, playing guitar. But my earliest memories were like, my mother loves Stevie Nicks too. So uh, it's really not that surprising what I was surrounded by. Um, but I grew up in the grunge era. So it's a lot of amalgamation of different kinds of music. Um, let's say like the Pink Floyd vibes are pretty strong. Like, a, cause I think that that was like their favorite band. I even went to like the Grateful Dead with them and- um, Did you really? <laughs> But you were, yeah, you were it was a, were they deadheads or were they just kind of like casual dead fans? No, 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 they weren't okay. dead heads. Um, but um, I don't know why they took us to that concert, but it was on the Voodoo Lounge tour with the uh, for the dead or for for the Stones. 
the dead. Um, <clears throat> wait, am I getting mixed up here? Yeah, Voodoo Lounge was the Stones, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. Did and you then, start the Stones? Um, no, I, I'm getting the name of the tour mixed up then. Okay, um, okay. But anyway. Blah. Sorry, I'm like still drinking coffee. We went to a lot of concerts, basically. We saw Neil Young at the Orpheum. Mm. Um, you know, maybe it was the Rolling Stones and not the, it was, yeah, the tongue. Sorry. Um, that was Voodoo Lounge. Yeah, yeah. That was, that was that a was... huge difference between the yeah, kind of and the different. Rolling Stones. Right, right. <laughs> and well, it's I don't know. I mean, those... I guess, you know, the Stones have Keith Richards, who's probably going to outlive every human being on the planet. And then you had Jerry Garcia, who didn't live that long. So, yeah, kind of a difference there. But I'm not much of a deadhead, so I can't really speak to a lot. I think I own, like, Terrapin Station and Working Man's Dead. But I just never fell into that that thing so much. But the Floyd thing, it's interesting that you mentioned that because that's going to come up relative to a specific song we're going to talk about. And yeah. I could definitely hear that Pink Floyd. What's your favorite Floyd album? I actually like a lot of them. And I'm not one of those people that is only a fan of like the Sid Barrett era. Mm -hmm. I really think, I mean, it's, it makes me sad that like what's kind of going on with them right now. But, oh, um, yeah. but I mean, there's like a string of albums that I love from um, Wish You Were Here, Metal Animals, Dark Side, I put the soundtrack to the film one more, uh, more. Mm -hmm. and yeah. i mean i like pretty much everything up to a certain point and then like even like the i mean my parents had like the what did they put out the division bell in the 90s or something yeah i'm trying to think and what year that was that was when i stopped listening to the new releases but um i saw them on the momentary lapse tour and division bell and you know, they were fantastic. It was just an amazing experience. But, it, you know, it's a band that, frankly, they were the sum of their parts. And when Roger left, there was there was something different. That said, Roger Waters is a really bitter old guy. And he's got billions of dollars. So what are they fighting over? It doesn't make any sense to me at this point. But I guess, you know, I guess millionaires fighting, that's the kind of thing that they do, right? But um, so... You're known for your voice, of course, and do you have any distinct memories when you first realized you could sing and or maybe the people around you realized that you had something unique going on with your voice? Yeah, I mean, like I was a really shy kid, but like before I became a shy, I mean, I was always shy, but I, I like to sing just um, like always, basically. And But mm -hmm. then I kind of clammed up a bit and never like in school and was too shy to be in chorus or anything like that so there's kind of like i secretly like to sing in the shower and stuff um but it wasn't until like much later that i got into singing music like music probably age 14 or something so right around like high school when you're getting into high school or Late, yeah. late grade or something like that. Yeah. Um, was you said your brother played in a band? He played guitar. Did he kind of teach you the the bar chord things and the the open chords and all that kind of stuff like that? He tried to. I like. I'm a left-handed person that um, learned righty guitar because oh. that's oh, what wow. we had in the house. So right. I mean, technically now I'm pretty much fully ambidextrous, but like I let write and paint with my left hand. Um, okay. But then I like do sports mostly right handed, like bowling that? or bait, right. you know. Right, it's very right. strange. So I had a hard time with lessons in general. Like I think back then people weren't as familiar with different kinds of learning um like learning styles basically. Sure. And so I just would space out pretty immediately whenever somebody was telling me how to do something. Um, so I, he taught me some good stuff though, but then I kind of, I tried taking lessons and I didn't like them because I didn't want to learn Ode to Joy because I was already like writing songs immediately and oh, really? didn't really, I didn't really want to learn the, um, 
I wish I had stayed in lessons. I'll, I'll be honest with you, but we had like a Bob Dylan songbook, and that's pretty much how I learned how to sing and play at the same time. Ah, okay. Like this big book with every single song of his, and that that was pretty helpful as a writer, I think. Dylan's going to come up here shortly, a, a lot of Dylan. I have my own Dylan sort of story, and I kind of wanted you to hear yours, but you kind of told me it there, but we'll, we'll circle back around to it a little bit. Um, I, are you ambidextrous playing? Can you play both ways or no. just right? You're just for guitar. You're the, you're right handed. Yeah. And okay. it's actually been a bit, bit of a struggle, like to get my right. I have a kind of an interesting finger picking style. Like I just use my yep. thumb and first finger and I have to really like force, like it was, I remember learning how to finger pick and it, it took longer than it, it should have to learn, but once I got it, it really clicked, but it wasn't like my natural hand. So yeah, I have a strong left hand with like pull-offs and hammer-ons and stuff. So, you know. I tried to do your finger picking. I, yeah. I can't do it. Cause I'm used to yeah. using, I'm used to you. Wait a minute. Can you hear that? I think it sounds pretty good. Yeah. See, I'm used to using, this is the only guitar I have left, my old Ovation, which the top is cracked on, which is yeah. a bummer. But, you know, I use, if you can see my. That's good. You're, you're doing it like the way they say to do it. The right yeah, way. The, <laughs> the thumb and the three fingers. I can even yeah. use my, my pinky sometimes, but not, not real well. But, um, you get a lot of mileage out of the way that you play. It's you get you have a lot going on fairly intricately, whereas most players would choose to incorporate other fingers. And have yet you, you've said you've tried to do it and you struggle with I, it? Or? I can do like full hand picking, uh -huh. um, but it's it's actually easier for me. I have more control and strength with just like the claw. The claw. Um, when I do like um, arpeggiated, like all the fingers, mm -hmm. it's just a little bit weaker because I have to build up my um, pinky, you know. So. I'm surprised. Has Milky been at you about that? He's been trying to teach you the, the five finger sort of thing. No, no. OK, because he's a really good finger picker. Yeah, you know, I'm pretty stubborn about. Um, about I'm, um, you know, I like. Do the, the things the way I do them. <laughs> you know? well, I would assume too. Singing, you you're more comfortable in that that claw zone because you have you know what's going on. That muscle memory is there, and mm -hmm. everything's the way you need it. So you can focus more on your, you know, your vocal energy, right? Yeah, I think like, um, well, I love finger picking. I just. I think it's just because I started learn. Well, my brother played this way too, and oh, wow, so really? that's how he shows me showed me okay. how to do it. And I can't really play with a pick either. Like, um, really struggled. I don't like the sound of it. Um, on the, I just like even when I'm with a band and I need to dig in. It's, right. I still prefer to use like the back side of my nail. Your fingernail. Okay. Do you use a pick much at all, or? Just, no, uh, just very on, rarely. Okay, just on maybe like songs where you might just be strumming, or do you use your fingers mostly? But mostly the fingers. Yeah. Wow, that's cool. When did you first start playing? How old were you? I think it was like thirteen or fourteen, but then by the age of sixteen, I was like pretty serious about um, songwriting, or I was taking it seriously, not as a career, but or anything like that but i was like a i was a devout um practitioner yeah. yeah yeah well that was one of my questions when you were in school did you feel you wanted to be a, a musician as a possible career but you actually ended up going to art school after high school right and you got your bachelor's and i think your master's correct mm -hmm. what was there aspirations at that point in time to maybe go into commercial art or to do, you know, teaching or what was like, was that the yeah. plan B or was that the plan A that became plan B, I guess? Like I never, when I went, I mean, I really wanted to be a 
painter. Um, like I was more known as a fine artist, like growing up in town and mm -hmm. was, that was like my biggest uh, skill. I mean, I, I don't really use the word talent just because it like negates the concept of work ethic. Um, mm -hmm. I ob obviously have a teaching degree, so I'm like, um, I wanted to be like a, a successful painter, but the problem is that's almost as hard as being a successful musician. And yeah. during <laughs> during art school, I ended up majoring in illustration. Sorry about that. With, oh, that's okay. Illustration, which was like, um, kind of thinking there would be an application for some kind of work when I really should have majored in graphic design. Oh, like yeah, back then it didn't seem like compu computers w were going to take over the world quite as <laughs> yeah. much as they did. Yeah, right. Um, so, and then I got a teaching degree, but during that time at school, I was, I started to play open mic nights and it was like, at that school, everybody is so good that it was an outlet, um, maybe, I don't know, like just something to, that I like to do for fun because painting became work. Um, ah. Then they just kind of balanced uh, the, the, the scale tip. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did, um, well, let me ask you, I've heard you say in, I'm going to get this. This is later, but I'm going to get it out of the way now because I'm just curious about it. So you're 1920 in this age. You're doing these open mic nights and, you know, coffee house type things. And you're doing covers and originals or just covers or ori all originals? Or Mostly. I played at this bar in Providence called the Custom House Tavern, which closed down by the time I had left Providence. But um, and like hung out with a bunch of old dudes playing um at the bar and i'd go with my friend and she'd watch me and i even made them put reverb on back then like uh -huh. <laughs> i had a stylistic um yeah. visions from the very beginning that they are uh, a lot of these guys at the open mics were like real purists um right. both with the right hand technique and with my sonic taste um so i just remember getting a lot of unsolicited advice and wasn't a fan of that but yeah that's i was the, that's playing the old most... dudes that's the old dude syndrome i know because i'm an old dude so. <laughs> yeah i didn't i the i was briefly in like a songwriter association i didn't really fit in with the coffee house people like because i'm i was so dark and morbid from <laughs> i mean my I think it was partially that I wanted to distinguish myself from the coffee house folkies. And right. so I just became like obsessed with more um, writing these death ballads from the age of 18. I, I really start, um, was pretty out there. I mean, go, looking back on that first record, it, it's really like the inspiration is kind of, um, all made up you know well, we're gonna get there in a minute we're almost there um yeah i, I kind of want to hold off a little bit because I, I have specific questions about certain songs do, um do you remember how how encouraging were your parents and nurturing were your parents with this it sounds like they were pretty nurturing because i think i read somewhere that they helped you demo some songs or something like um that. yeah like I mean, they weren't, nobody expected me to have a career in music. I mean, mm -hmm. I kind of took, it was, it kind of happened by chance that I, but they've been very encouraging in terms of the arts, like, and I'm lucky because a lot of parents are not um, that, like, it was just a, like a birthday present when I was turned 16, like a couple hours in a studio in New Hampshire. Oh, wow. Um, so it was like, and my brother and his friends played on this record, and it was, it was, oh, really? nobody's ever heard it or anything. Are these nobody the two ever... albums that exist that you've never released? Yeah, they're not going to get released. They're terrible, okay. but um, <laughs> it's like, really, uh, everybody's got those embarrassing first attempts at writing. I mean, there's a couple, 
think I was always pretty decent with words, but my voice was like, I not really there yet. And, uh, and my play, I don't know. Um, but yeah, it was, they were really encouraging. And I just like the first record that I recorded. Um, well, we're going to get to that, but yeah, mm -hmm. just a minute. We're almost there. Um, let me ask you one or two quick more questions here. Uh, first album you bought with your own money. Do you remember? Yeah, it's a surprising one. Uh, the Go Fugees. Go. The Fuji. Fugees. Fugees. Score, okay, cool. Which dates me a bit, like, because, but I love that record. I still love that record. Yeah. And, um, and then I, I, I mean, I was buying a lot of, like, I loved Hole. I mean, I grew up in mm -hmm. the Riot Girl era, too. So I loved L7. I loved yeah. Ani DeFranco. Um, and, I still love Ani DeFranco. Cat because Power, stuff like Cat Power. and I got into her a little bit later because she didn't get um, popular till I was in college. when, Or she was out there, but she kind of blew up with the covers record. And that came out when I was like 18 or 19. But the um, I really was like a righteous babe in high school. Like I had like a little punk band with my friend. Can and I ask you about that? I was really into like screaming. It's kind of surprising. I got into like the music I got into because my mother was tired of hearing about screaming. Um, she didn't like Courtney Love's voice. Uh -huh. And um, <laughs> so she was like, she got me into Carol King and Joni Mitchell. And um, I got into Leonard Cohen through Nirvana, um, Penny Royalty. Oh yeah, called. yeah, Penny Royalty, right, right kind of a game changer once i discovered him i was like wow it was like being handed like the key to the kingdom or something oh uh, so um what's it not murder ballads what's it called uh, songs of love and death right yeah um love and hate yeah. love and hate i'm sorry love and hate yeah it's such a great album i'm not a super knowledgeable cullen guy um but i i can see, you know, he's one of those guys like Dylan that was such an incredible wordsmith and just was so evocative with just the prose that he wrote, you know, exit the music or, or you know, beside the music. He just was such an, uh, it's just a cinematic sort of writer, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But um, so let's see. You told me your first concert was Jethro Tull, which is kind of crazy. That's pretty cool. Um, now that would have been in the '90s, I guess, right? '90s or maybe early, late '90s. It might have right. been in the yeah. '80s. Um, I really? don't remember. Oh, wait, I was born in '81, so you've been pretty um, young then, huh? Oh yeah, they were. Yeah. I don't remember how. I, I would have to Google when they played um, with Procol Harum, but yeah, yeah, I know. They're, yeah. they're Procol pretty cool. Harum hasn't been around for a while, I don't think. So, I saw them for Roots to Branches and. I think it was like Catfish Rising or Crest of a Nave, one of those two. Didn't see him in the heyday. I mean, you know, I'm a considerably older than you. I'm, I'll be 57 at the end of the month. And my first love, of course, was Kiss because that was the band of the 70s. So Kiss yeah. Alive was my first album. And Kiss was my first concert in 1979. And the crazy thing was two days before the show, I was living in Houston at that time. Two days before that show, Judas Priest, who was opening for them, left the tour. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, I could have seen Priest on Hellbent for Leather, you know, because I'm a yeah. metalhead guy, you know. But I love everything. That's that's the thing. So um, do you, you, you said you didn't do anything like the talent show or dances, like school dances or anything like that? You didn't? You weren't there yet? No? Definitely not. I was like, uh, yeah, no. Um. Oh, it's what you would expect in high school. Like uh, the girl in the corner. <laughs> were you? I mean, God, yeah. I mean, I was like the art girl that was. Um, were you? Were you the Ali Sheedy on Breakfast Club? Just not so pretty weird. Pretty much. Not so weird. Just kind of the Ali Sheedy. I mean, maybe weirder. Yeah. Like I definitely <laughs> was not um, in the cool group. Let's okay. say that. But. <laughs> but you weren't eating I... sugar sandwiches, right? No, okay. and I was definitely already wearing a lot of black. And <laughs> were you? Were I mean, you? So you were a goth girl, kind of, sort of. Kind of, yeah, like a 
but I was a good student. I was a bit of a nerd, you know. Oh yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, nerd nerds are awesome. Um, yeah. All right, so before we get into the origin story here, you kind of told me about the punk rock band. What was the name of it? Do you remember? We never named it. We like did? we did um, a couple of David <laughs> Bowie covers. Ooh. It was my friend Ingrid and this girl Jessica, and we just like practiced and we did one show at like the high school cafeteria for something like after part of the literary magazine i was oh, wow. you know like so you were on guitar and vocals and one of them was playing and she was and ingrid was also on guitar and vocals okay and, and then um i i could i could really scream back then no and way lost the ability to do that i'm gonna i'm working on trying to find that again by the time I turned 18, I like couldn't sing like that anymore. I think I just got like I don't I don't know if I can fathom Marissa Nadler screaming. I that's something I I, I fear, but I kind of want to see it, you know. You it was know like a I mean? different person, yeah. 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 Um so we, we got through the art school in Rhode Island and you did talk about uh the the open mic nights and stuff like that, but how did you actually come to be signed by Eclipse Record and come by this record deal and start your pro career? Well, I wouldn't quite call it like a record deal. For I would okay. call it like um, a, more like a it was a mail order distribution um, back in the days where that was like the big thing. And mm -hmm. I was uh, actually, it was through a man named Jeffrey Alexander who was like in the Providence scene he had a little record label called Secret Eye and um, was in a little band um, at the time and was just really supportive and did a compilation called um, For the Dead in Space, which was a tribute to Tom Rapp and um, who I wasn't familiar with at the time until he asked me to do it, um, Pearls Before Swine. And oh, yeah. All yeah. The and all these really cool people were on that compilation and mm -hmm. i was it was my first ever recorded release was a, like on that record and so i he gave me a list of like label people that he knew just because he really liked my songwriting and mm -hmm. ed hardy from eclipse was just like a nice guy and was like yeah sure i'll put this out the ballads of living and dying it was super low-key I mean, this was before MySpace. This was before um, mm -hmm. everything. This yeah, is yeah. when I had to try to convince Ed. I was like, maybe we should put MP3s up. And it was like this huge, it, it was, wasn't that long ago, but things really, really changed. Um, well, 2003-ish, 2004-ish. I mean, you know, yeah. you heard my story. That's how I came by you. I saw the cover and I was kind of, okay, that caught my eye because it is a fetching sort of cover. It's just, it speaks to a certain person like me that is like, oh, I can feel something from just the, the, the image. And then I listened to those crappy MP3s. Because, you know, back then you'd, you'd, be, you'd be playing them through crappy speakers on the side of your computer or whatever. And I was like, okay, 55 Falls was it. That's all I need to hear. I'm like, I'm ordering it. And so. Oh, that's sweet. Still have that um, album. Still have it. I'm still fond of that record. I wrote it. I was like so pretentious back then. I wrote it on a typewriter. Um, I was a little bit of a Luddite and re like kind of resistant to co the computer takeover at first and uh -huh. into old instruments like banjos and uh, Appalachian doll. Oh, you froze. Uh oh. Are you there? You froze, Marissa. Can you hear me? Oh. You're there. Hello. You're there. I just, yeah. yeah. So you were saying I, you were a Luddite and you were writing that. You were talking about lyrically. You were writing it out on the typewriter. Yeah, um, I worked really hard on that record. I and I would like not let people look at me when I played music either. Um, really? I just like was so shy that it was really yeah. hard for me to transition to performing. Um, yeah. Then I'm like, but yeah, Ed was just like, I love this record. Let's put it out. And 
I didn't ever expect anything to really come of it. Other, like, I got a job at teaching art in Harlem. Mm -hmm. um, like I moved to New York City. I was playing at like little clubs, um, but I, it was really just something I did. Like it wasn't something I, where I was dead set on becoming a famous musician right. ever. And that's still not my thing. I was always taking the craft pretty seriously and was surprised when people reviewed it. I remember the Aquarius records and other music both wrote these really nice write-ups and I was, didn't really know what those stores were at the time. So I was only really familiar with like Newberry comics and oh yeah, and, yeah. Um, yeah. Up Northeast. Yeah. Yeah. So those write-ups like, those record stores were very um, influential vital. Yeah. and vital and wrote great things that got people interested. And so I have like Aquarius to thank for that and other music. Yeah, I, um, Marissa, that's the reason I bought the album. I mean, yeah. I was, Stephen Wilson and I were doing a lot of trading of ideas of things back then. He's like, you got to check out this. I'm like, you got to check out that. Cause I was really into industrial. I was really yeah. into stuff like skinny puppy and frontline assembly and, you know, Cam FDM and stuff like that. And he's like, oh, you got to check out Square Pusher and Aphex Twin and all this really weird, you know, warp the Warp Records stuff. I don't know if you're familiar with that stuff, but, you know, Boards of Canada, stuff like that. Yeah. And, and all that stuff was happening. And then I, you know, I was getting into black metal. I was getting into death metal at that point in time. And then I run across this, this album with you and I'm like, whoa. And it just, well, let's get into that real quick. So okay. if I recall correct, um, where are we at here? Sorry. I do have to cheat a little bit because I'm old and I can't remember everything. <laughs> um, so you put out The Bounds of Living and Dying on January 31st, 04 on Eclipse. And apparently it was recorded on a digital BR-8 Boss 8 track. Now, the interesting thing about this is my very first recording was on a Boss BR-8. My first song that I ever wrote, like full song, October Skies, was on, on a BR-8, which is crazy. Cool. Um, were all these songs that you had, were these all songs that you brought in to be recorded that you had been refining and working on? Or were they, did you write them specifically for this album or how, what was the process? Like? I just, um, I wrote, I wanted to make a record and I, this guy Miles uh, recorded it um, every Wednesday. He had off from work, it took him uh, over a year to like, cause we just did a song at a time. And I think it's like an excuse to hang out. Um, yeah. And yeah, so I, the, I came in with the songs already ready to go. Like um, he did a lot of the like, Ebo, slidey guitar and the production mm -hmm. on that, and um, credit him with like a lot for that record. And oh, you know, it was really a hobbyish thing, and I never expected that many people to hear the record. Right, and then. My brother was like cooler th than I was, and I guess Pitchfork reviewed that first record and gave it a, like a really good review. And yeah. I had no idea what that meant, or like it's different now. You like have like these huge marketing campaigns. Oh, absolutely! Stuff. Yeah. But back then, it, that site was actually a real champion of independent music and underground stuff. And I was, I came from that world, you know, so. Our special guest is going to pop on around 3.05. I'm watching. Okay. So, um, so the, you know, for me, if I recall correct, oh, wait, who played the day, the banjo on Days of Rum? That was a banjo. Was that him? That's or me. You? Yeah. That's, that's you. Me. Very cool, man. That is so cool. You know what's cool about it? I'll tell you what's cool about it. It reminds me a lot of 16 Horsepower. Do you know 16 Horsepower? No, but I'll write it. I'll check them Marissa, out. Marissa, you must, must. Okay. Trust me. You're going to love 16 horsepower. Do okay. you know Woven Hand? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so it's David Eugene Edwards, the okay. singer of Woven Hand. It's his band before that, but it is it is so in your wheelhouse. It's gothic Americana country mixed with doom and glue. It's so... Like frankly, you two, you going out on tour with those guys, they're they're they've broken up, they're not together anymore. Would be the perfect it would just be so awesome, but it's not gonna happen because they don't they're not together anymore. I'll send you some links. I'm gonna send you a bunch of stuff. Cause if you remember, you put a little feeler out on your Instagram about um ambient music and I hit you up with a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. 
I don't remember it was me, but it was Metal Madness because I have another IG, not, not this, but I told you to check out some cool stuff. I've got a lot more cool stuff for you to check out on that front because I'm an ambient nerd. Um, if I recall correctly, you did do some touring off this album or was it not till the next album? I did. Um, I actually was teaching art and doing a really terrible job. I was just too young to teach a class with that many people. Um, and yeah, so um, like 35 kids in a classroom in Harlem and I was just too shy to oh my get my classroom management down and was just like not good, not ready to be a teacher yet. And I got this um, but invitation to play some sh small shows in Europe and it just seemed like an opportunity that I was still so young and right. kind of nursing a broken heart and said, why not? And How I quit my job. Here? How old are you here? 21, 20? Um, older than that, because I stayed and we got a master's degree. So I, it was like, I don't even know, maybe 22 or something. I was really young um, and I did like some touring my first U.S. tour was with um, Jack Rose, rest in peace. Um, he's a great guitar player and did some shows with Earth and Boris, like really early on. Oh, um, my God, really? I, was, I, had, mm -hmm. um, I had a really great early booking agent. Um, she doesn't do booking anymore, but Angela just, I would just happen to come up with some, it was back then, like Earth was did hadn't had there. I just played sh shows with cool people. Yeah, um, but I was young and had a, a lot to prove still. That was the big um, Earth and Boris came to me through Aquarius as well. I wouldn't have known about him if it wasn't for yeah. that website. I mean, that was such a great wealth of information on not non-standard you know your standard radio rock and that stuff and earth you know I, I finally got to see earth strangely enough i got to see earth about a week after i finally got to see you live in 2018 for the first and only time i got to see earth at a festival i was talking to dylan and mentioned that i i had just seen you the week before and super nice guy really 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 cool great band cool band to watch boris now i've seen them twice or no three times God, what an amazing band live. Oh, my God. They're just, it's, yeah. you got to experience it. You can't, you know, I don't know exactly what they're up to lately because they put so much stuff out. It's hard to keep up with what they're doing. Yeah. But, I think I only played like one show with them. It was in Texas, I, but like, it was like a South by, it was like a South by Southwest showcase. Oh, or South by Southwest. Like that, yeah. Where I was like. I don't think they remember, but I do. Like a, um, like a showcase type thing. Yeah, for like Eclipse booking at the time or something, because I think it was a long time ago. I don't remember. But yeah, we still have so many albums to cover. <laughs> yes, for sure. Oh, okay. um, for me, the standout tracks on here, 55 Falls, just, yeah. a, I mean, that's a signature track for you, I think, and you'd admit that. Um, Annabelle Lee is great. Bob Cedars, which I think you then called your own little imprint label, after yeah. that song and the undertaker is killer and mayflower may they're just all great tracks i really really love that album um so good uh let's see so and the one thing i i really noted from it is that there's a storyteller developing with all the lyrical vignettes and in, what were so the influences had to have been dylan and cohen right because i mean that's that was one in my notes i can hear dylan and cohen and maybe maybe even a little bit of gordon lightfoot in the sadder songs that he does. Are you a Gordon Lightfoot fan at all? I don't know. I'm um, no. no, I mean, I don't, I might be, but I've never listened to him. I, I was actually really into Joni Mitchell and um, Nina Simone as well. But back then I was, re I always read a lot. So my influences were not just musical, but like literary. I just, I mean, I can't even, I just, was kind of bookish and so the influences came from a lot of places but um i would say the biggest influence is like joni mitchell okay We're not really sonically as much as um the way i mean she's like noted as one of the first confessional songwriters and just her her 
lyrics were really great. So, I mean, big shout out, but yeah, Bob Dylan. But then I, at the same time, I was really in the like Nick Cave at the time, like, oh, and that yeah. Murder Ballads record had a big influence on me and was what got me into like the, some of the old original Murder Ballads. Right, the like, birthday party stuff, you know, has a little more punk to it. Yeah, but then I like it got me into like old folk ballads and stuff. Oh, okay, gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Um, you're probably gonna smoke me on that stuff because I know some of it, but you know, like the old Woody Guthrie and and you know, um, the old Hank Williams, they do a lot of those sad, sort of dreary, sort of lyrical stuff like that, but I'm not as familiar. Johnny Cash even does a lot of cool stuff like that, too. Um, do um so but you don't know Gordon Lightfoot? You don't know like the wreck of the Edmonds Fitzgerald? No. Okay, I have to say you some stuff. Okay. you're gonna fall in love with him, I believe. Um so in two thousand five you released your second album, The yeah. Song of Mayflower May. And this is still on Eclipse, right? Yep. Okay. And you know, I've heard you talk about this album and say some things that you're not really happy with that album. I'd like you to kind of explain that a little bit, because I think one of the issues that I heard, I thought I heard you say was you weren't crazy about the vocals on it. And I actually think some of your best vocals are on best old style vocals. Cause you did change your vocal approach yeah. in coming albums. Um, but in your old style, I think it's great. What was there any pressure at that point to come up with material? Or did you still have a wealth of, a backlog of tracks to, to put on this album. It was I was not having any problem writing, but yeah, I'm not crazy about the vibrato on my voice and that like I just I was influenced by like some stuff and it just I don't think it really sounds like me. I stand behind the writing still, mm -hmm. but I just I don't know. Like I it does it's the one record that I don't enjoy listening to, but you know, everybody's got, I mean, I don't listen to any of my records, but that one yeah, in particular, yeah. I, I like have toyed with the concept of removing it from the internet completely, but then really? it's like, yeah, but you know, cause why bother? Part of being It'll just pop up is somewhere. Letting, you, you, you can't stop it. Once it's on the internet, you can't stop it. It's almost impossible. I think, um, it's interesting because under an old umbrella is just a beautiful song. I can see that maybe you're, you are a little histrionics, not the right word, but maybe there's a little bit of that going on there, but like melodrama. Yeah. yeah, a little bit, but I kind of like it. I don't know. It, I think that's a beautiful, beautiful song. And they have kind of a, a Joni Mitchell vibe to them on this album. And another artist that I'd be curious if you know, are you familiar with Linda Perhox? Yes, I love her. Or, or I mean, the one I love. Her, Lover Lover Grand. Grand. What an amazing, amazing album. Um, I hear a little bit of her in you. You guys have some similarities. And, you know, I'm sorry. I don't want to upset you by comparing you to other people. Oh, no. That's the way we get reference points, particularly for people that might run across this and not know anything about you. But um, you said you feel that the album does stand up. Um, but... <laughs> what um are you, you are happy with the songs you said and do you do you find you often, do you find you often second guess yourself when you recorded a set of songs i didn't at the time like i thought the record was pretty good when i made it i think and then <laughs> just as the years passed i just my style my taste changed i wasn't into like revival medieval music anymore <laughs> like it was just like a phase i was going through and sure, i sure. um it just uh, really was still trying to find myself like musically i think and you're um, very young at that point you're only 25 26 right younger i think i don't even know but yeah it's a blur but i'm not i i still like a few songs on that record but i could like take it or leave it um I still yeah. I like the album. I still like it a lot. Right. Um, I'm gonna get a pen just to sure, like sure, doodle sure. while well, I can't um, really. Um, you're, you're in the room there. I was just gonna say, was that done in a proper studio or was it again like an apartment like you did the first one? And also, you recorded that in Philly. Were you living down there? Uh, and 
How did you get involved with Brian McTeer? I love Brian McTeer. Um, he, I was actually hanging out with the Espers folk, like, and that's how I met um, Brian McTeer. He recorded, he worked with like, Espers was a band, for those of you that don't know, because I will share this interview, um, with Meg Baird, who now has a burgeoning, not burgeoning, a successful and flourishing solo career. She and she's amazing, back. for those of you that aren't familiar. Yeah. Um, and Greg Weeks, <clears throat> Helena Espival, and I met people like Mary Lattimore, who I'm still friends with, right. um, way back then in Philly. So I recorded that there? record. Were you no, I just okay, drove so down. Traveling down. I had moved back to Providence. I w I've moved around a lot. So okay. moved out of New York and back to Providence um, and then recorded it in Philadelphia. And um, and then I recorded the, yeah, the third, that it was a proper studio, Minor Street recording. Okay. And, but it was all done live. I didn't even know what a click track was. Like, it, wow. um, no kidding. I didn't know how to play and sing separately at that time. Because it's a really different time. Like we didn't have garage band and right, right. I had a four track recorder. And so you only got four tracks. So if you wanted harmonies, you'd have to pick like and I that the second record is important for one it was the first time I'd ever sung a harmony ever. Like Brian made me try it. So, um, you know, I think the only reason I don't like it is just taste. It's just I think the harmonies on it are pretty damn beautiful. So let's jump on to the third album, Berta on the Water, which was released March 12th on uh, 07. And it came out on Commando Records, which is out of Brooklyn or was out of Brooklyn. I don't know if they're still in Kamado. Yeah. Kamado. I'm sorry. Yeah, Kamado. Can't read my own writing. Kamado and Peace Frog over in the UK, which is is or was an independent label. I don't know if these labels are still existing at this point, but um, Kamado and that, still exists. Uh, well, Kamado became Mexican Summer Records. Um, okay. And um, Peace Frog, I think, still exists. They put out like Jose Gonzalez, and um, yeah, the the third record is what most people heard for the first time of mine. Yeah. Yeah, because those first two I got off of, of Aquarius. I got the second one from there, too, because, it, you know, I was kind of aware. By that time, I already had the first album, a good six, eight months. Then Saga came out. I'm like, oh, cool. More Marissa. I'm down. Um, the third album, I don't even remember. I don't remember where I picked the, the album up. I have it. By the way, I did not pull out any of these albums because uh, I had to move because of COVID. My yeah. landlord died and I had to move to a new apartment. We don't have room for my CD racks. That's because I have like 4,000 CDs. There's no way I yeah. can put them here. But I, I did want to show something quick here while we're at it. Um, so I pulled up all the the album covers and we'll just look at these quick. Okay. So there's Ballads of Living, Living and Dying. And again. I'm so prepared. This really is a deep dive. Okay. Is, well, I, I kind of warned yeah. you. <laughs> I do my work. I really do. Yeah. Um, because it's a labor of love for me. I don't make any money from this. This is about you and showcasing your amazing songwriting and, and singing and whatnot. So yeah, this is the cover that kind of sucked me in, man. It was ghostly and haunting. I know I said I wasn't going to say it, but I'm going to say it. Um, let's take a look at where are we at? Where are we at here? I'm sorry. Let's take a look at this one quick here. Yeah, that cover of Saga of Mayflower May was done by an illustrator named George Parsons, who used to do Dream Magazine. Um, and it was like, I don't know if you there was this website called Terrascope. Yes. Um, oh, yeah. And that was like the scene I came up in was like the Terrascope magazine scene, weirdly. And like, that's why there's still a lot of like old men that come to my shows. Like, <laughs> Because they were bit not well now they're older, but they weren't then. You You're know. making me feel um, bad. I'm feeling really old now. No, that's not what I meant. I meant like <laughs> I'm old now. I, I no, mean, you're I, not. You're still very young, my la my lass. Did, did did this? Can you see it? Yeah. 
Okay, I don't know why I can't. There it is. Okay. Um, so, yeah, the, is the picture real or is that a, a drawing of you? It's real. It's okay. um, high contrast. It's a okay. posterized. Yeah. Now, there, like just... there you look like a goth girl, hardcore. You looked at Victorian sort of, there, there's just a Victorian look to this album and the whole. You know what I mean? The, the English Victorian period. It just has that that kind of look. Yeah. Um, very cool there. And then let's see if I can figure out how to do this, Jeff. Can I figure this out? Ooh, how am I doing? What am I doing here? There we go. And then we're on this album real quick, which we'll yeah. talk about real fast while it's up. I wish I could your, do this a little quicker. Is I'm your special quick. guest waiting right now? Not yet that I see. Let me give me one okay. minute. See if she's here. Hang on. There she is. Nope. Nope. There. Nope. She's not here yet. Okay. Um, that's the middle thing. So this is uh, songs three, uh, "Bird on the Water." Yeah. And this is after this album is where I things changed for me, and I just kind of had a lot going on in life, a relationship, and I didn't follow as much. But this is still a very, very pretty album. Um, this album is a little bit this is where marissa starts to transition her songwriting for me um you start to add a lot more instrumentation you've got a lot a lot of accompaniment players in the studio not a lot but a few mm -hmm. and um you know you're adding a bit more in terms of supporting musicians uh was this due to your desire to write more complex and denser songs even though most of the songs are still generally structured around acoustic guitars and, and vocals or not I don't really, I think I thought about it. I I mean, the songs were written and then I brought them in. Greg Weeks recorded this record at Hex, his little basement studio called Hexam Head in Philadelphia. Greg was in the Espers and mm -hmm. had a solo career as well where he put some records out on Bada Bing. Um, but he, I just kind of let him, like, I, he was just having fun and I trusted his tastes, like, with that's what you kind of do with producers early on and um so he played some riffs like on um i think mary Lattimore plays on this record as well um like a longtime collaborator uh helena espival who's now still performing as an avant-garde cellist and, mm -hmm. yeah was she, in, was she in espers too or i think she was yeah part of the band as well so you know this record was the one that a lot of people connected with first um like diamond heart and um mm -hmm. that song you know i my taste has changed a lot since this record as well so well i will say just, this diamond mm -hmm. heart has a lot of that histrionic vocal thing going on if you ask me this album has more going on vocally than i think was this the album where you started to figure out where you wanted to go with your vocals or was it because on the next one uh, little hells there's a noticeable difference in the way that yeah. you're singing i think this was like the last of my vibrato uh, right that's what i think so, too yeah which is great i mean it's okay to change and it's um it's good it's imperative as an artist to change and transform and evolve actually so i can look back on this stuff as like my early those three records are my early work and my style really did change sure yeah. sure no doubt um on this one there um let's see here just want to check my my notes real quick uh this one mexican summer that's a real gem on this album what a beautiful beautiful song is that 12 string you're using you um remember? i think it's i don't remember okay it sounds like a like a 12 string and it sounds strummed as opposed to finger picked um yeah bird on your grave another really cool one with an unusual amount of lead guitar because that was never anything that we heard before with any yeah. of your albums and that one was that greg or who was that yeah that's greg and okay. that's it's actually my favorite song on this record, Bird on Your Grave. Um, yeah, it's very different for you. Very gothy all yeah. the way through these first three records. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Which is super cool. Um, 
you also do um well actually i was gonna say are there tracks on here that you're particularly proud of from a compositional standpoint obviously burn on wire probably and mexican summer is just so cool i i, I love that song yeah i i, I think not really compositionally but it, i i a lot of the lyric writing i can stand by on this one but so long ago that i don't yeah, I know. Like, I know. connect hard. with the emotion in the songs as much anymore but i i know a lot of people like this record so i'm not gonna you also do your first recorded cover on an album that i'm aware of right or am i wrong with famous blue raincoat is this the first yeah. that's first one and that's a leonard cohen track um you um we'll see a lot more covers coming shortly <laughs> a lot more yeah. covers and cool covers too we're gonna touch on those we're gonna we're not gonna dig in deep because that's i, I kind of want to do the studio albums and we'll yeah touch on certain tracks that you did because some of your covers are just mind-blowing to be honest with you um march of 2009 you as i told you this was kind of where i disconnected for a little yeah. while i had relationship stuff and teen kids to deal with and yeah. soccer practice and all that kind of stuff and a, a real job. And so um, March of 09, you put out an, an album called Little Hells. And right away, there's a marked difference in the songwriting now. Um, it's a much more lush album. It's got a lot more going on it. There's a lot more uh, supporting musicians on it. There's synths and keys and theremin and lap steel and drums. Were you hearing these instruments in your head when you're writing this songs or were they kind of created as you got into the studio and were able to utilize other people? I wasn't hearing the production. Like I really was focused on the writing. Um, Chris Cody produced this record and he worked with um, Beach House, did a mm -hmm. lot of their records, which you can really hear his um, production style. Because hey, I, we have a guest. Oh, great! We interrupted yeah. just for a sec yeah. to add our guest in because she misread my text message and thought she was coming on at two forty-five, and I didn't see her text. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only, Maddie Kiefer. How are you, baby? Hey, how's it going, guys? Good, Hi. good. How you doing, babe? Good. Hi, Marissa. Hi. Nice to meet you. So nice to meet you too. I loved your song that I heard. By the Thank way, you so much. I appreciate you that. Have, you have a really beautiful voice and great Thank playing. You. Yeah, so, loved it. The interesting dynamic that both you share is that Maddie's proudest point of her songwriting is her lyrics, which talking to you, Marissa, that's a huge thing for you as well. Um, I think, Maddie, you had a question for her regarding sort of that thing, right? Yeah, I was just curious. Uh, I know this is a pretty broad question, but what your songwriting uh, songwriting process is like. Um, so whether you have the intention going into it, like lyrically, or if that's something that sort of develops as you hear like melody um, develop. Yeah. It's, it's changed over time. But, you know, when I was younger, like life would like, my, you know, when you're young and you're having your first loves or first heartbreaks, like I felt compelled to write songs and like had to express them like a real urge. So they would really just come out all at, like melody and lyric at once. Just I would like sit and play. And it's gotten like my last record. On the other hand, um, the inspiration was a little bit more. Um, intellectualized from the start. Like I was like, wouldn't it be interesting to take these like Unsolved Mysteries episodes and write songs as a, as a game? Just cause I. Oh no, 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 she froze again. Are you there? Oh, you're kidding me. Marissa, go out and come back in real quick, if you can hear me. She froze up once before. I don't know if her internet signal's bad or... Hey, Marissa, if you... Uh, oh, wait, there you are. You froze back. for a second. <laughs> yeah, one of us is freezing. We're getting bad internet. So you were talking about intellectualizing uh, Path of the Clouds by watching 
a lot of uh, <laughs> unsolved mysteries and 48 hours and stuff like that? Yeah, like I actually like sat there because I was like fe feeling guilty, like I should be working while I'm watching television instead. So I, I started to take notes on the episodes and the songs really wrote themselves lyrically, but like a record like Strangers, for instance, I wrote with the cut up method lyrically, um, which was popularized, like David Bowie used it, but it comes from the Dada movement where yeah. you actually like cut um, words up and make like collages. Um, so the songs like Divers of the Dust came about because I was cutting up an astronomy book. Oh, wow. And like, then like later I would find meaning in the song. So my point is that inspiration like evolves over time. And I think it's important for artists to to change and to, to try new things like in terms of method. Matt, you've never written a heartache song, have you? A broken heartache? You've never done that, have you? I would say Time Bends, the one that I think you actually sent to Marissa is probably a heartbreak song. It's sort of about like what it feels like to be with somebody or what it felt like to be with somebody and to be like reminiscent and romanticizing of what that feels like, but not being able to have it. But um, yeah. I definitely resonate with all, all of the, that technique. I'm seeing myself um, intellectualize stuff a little bit more, um, but also the passion is still there where I'm like, I must take pen to paper this very moment. <laughs> it's spilling out of me. So that's awesome to hear. I think, yeah, like some of the best songs come out of those moments in life where you feel the absolute need to write. Like, uh, like my entire album, July, was like a really pivotal moment in my emotional life. And it shows like I think sometimes like a record, like there's all sorts of different records. But like when you have the big catalyst in your life, um, it, if you like writing, if if you like writing songs, it, it helps to have stuff to write songs about, like personal experience, you know. Yeah, the other thing I heard you say, Marissa, was David Bowie using the da da cut up method. Maddie, you can't stand David Bowie, right? <laughs> Not a fan. Yeah. <laughs> Who, Not even who, Ziggy Stardust. Who's responsible for making you listen to Bowie incessantly? There's some guy, right? You definitely planted the seeds. And then just within the past couple years, there was this like David Bowie bender I went on uh, over the summer. And that was it, you know, officially yeah. Uh, yeah, we're a Bowie actually, head. We're, now. <laughs> we're going to do a deep dive on David Bowie's whole entire catalog over a series of shows i'm going to do with maddie so um oh cool yeah it, uh well because david bowie's my favorite artist of all time just okay hands down like just a genius of, hard to explain how incredibly diverse and amazing that guy was um and maddie any other anything else you wanted to ask her like um like how tough it is to be in the music business <laughs> Um, I mean, sure, that's definitely a valid question. The other thing I was going to um, ask, but I feel like you kind of answered it, is what you derive uh, inspiration from most. Um, yeah. But I think you kind of like touched on like whether it's like life circumstance, perhaps an astronomy book, or your own heartbreaks. There, I feel like there's so many places to, to derive inspiration from. But if you want to wanted to speak upon that, that'd be great. Yeah, I think if you if you're an artistic person or an emotional or empathetic person, you're keeping your eyes open to the world around you. It, um, that's where the, I got, you have to have an open portal, I guess, to, um, under, to, for inspiration. I don't know if I'm rambling, but in terms of the music industry, yeah, it's like a pretty brutal industry, like most of the arts, uh, but, I wouldn't have it any other other way. Like if you, if you're, if you love to do something, you find a way. You know, I mean, obviously, with streaming has really changed things. Um, like people in my generation, you.
can get like millions and millions of plays, but it's like, okay, what else? How do you make a living off of it? And it, the streams do not do that. So you have to go on tour, have other things to supplement. Um, it's definitely not an easy career path. I would say that, but um, if you like, are you considering going in for um, like going on tours and stuff like that? I think at uh, some point that would be really awesome. Um, I definitely feel like I'm very much in the developmental phase of kind of getting to a place where I would even feel comfortable sharing my art, like via streaming or, um, you know, releasing music uh, to the world. Yeah. Um, and then what would follow that would naturally be like sharing that music live. Um, I'm just taking my time with it, really. And that's mm -hmm. been such a a grace because uh, I see myself developing as an artist in that time, just not putting that much pressure on it, um, exploring other avenues as well that bring me joy. So um, if it happens, it happens, but it's always really awesome to talk with people who have, you know, stayed patient and been a part of the process and gotten to where they are now, where they're releasing their art and, um, you know, happy to do it. <laughs> she, um, you, were, you did your first open mic. What, a couple months back and at a place she's in Asheville. She's not that far oh, from cool. Asheville. Uh, Asheville's good, really cool. Good place. Good place yeah. for arts. Um and you played like an open folk thing at where was it at again, Liz? Yeah, it's a um a showcase called Open Folk. Um but yeah, they just uh take like three artists, uh three to six artists per night and just let people gently weep to their guitars in front of a mic and it's a really cool space. Uh you pay not with like a cover charge, but with your attention. So that's been really nice to go to those spaces where people like actively are listening uh, to you. Yeah, that's amazing. Like, yeah, I I think if you wanted to have a career in music, you could. Yeah, I was really blown away by your voice and um, writing. So I know sharing is a whole different beast though, like, especially yeah. now with the internet like you are reaching like so many people at the same time it, it's scary well you the know? other thing too is you're putting that out there and then you can have really cruel ugly trolly people come by and say oh this shit sucks man she shouldn't be singing or you know that kind of crap and you have to kind of that i'll ask a question soon about that real quick because i know matt you gotta get back to work um tour uh playing live marissa you, you've done a lot of live shows over your mm -hmm. career and i know from what i've read and heard it's not you love playing live but you don't like the experience of having to do everything that gets you onto the stage and do you have stage fright can you still struggle yeah. with that anxiety and stuff i think i got over my stage fright once and for all opening up for ghost yeah, um, when, when Milky and I opened up for Ghost, that was like Pretty it was big. a make it or break it moment where like people were heckling me and I was terrified because there was like the they're huge and I yeah. nobody knew who I was and I it you kind of have to just like tell yourself you know you've got the, like a lot of self pep talks but I've had stage fright my whole career. And, I wondered um, about that. I wondered. Yeah, it's I'm just a shy person. So it was always a struggle. Now I have enough like self belief in the um, quality of my writing that right. like you, that I finally don't have as much self doubt, but it took a lot of work um, to believe it like that anybody would want to see me play or hear you know, these songs. <laughs> when I saw you in 2018. It was at the Boot and Saddle. I don't know if you remember that in Philadelphia. And it was this small little room in the back of a bar. I, maybe there might have been 100 people. There might have been 80. I don't know, 100, somewhere in that range. I was right up front, right off to, the, to your right. It was just you and Milky. And you could hear a pin drop in that room. Every, every song, even after songs ended, just people didn't know what to say it was just a beautiful thing because i'm used to going to big shows where people are drinking and they're they're not really a lot of them are going to shows aren't even paying attention but you know like the ghost maybe the ghost situation but 
the this show that I saw, Marissa, was just stunning. It was, you know, and I could kind of tell by looking at you that you were a little not unnerved. Not anxious isn't the word. I just think that you were kind of hyping yourself up to get going. And once you got going, it was just it was a flow and it was just a beautiful experience. And I know, Mads, do you do you experience stage fright when you did that that show? How was that for you? I think you just said it like um, when you're getting your footing on stage, you're like sort of reacclimating yourself because like it's like quantum physics, like people looking at you will inherently make you feel like you want to change the way in which you're acting. Um, at least that's what I experienced. But what's really beautiful is like if you believe in your writing and what you're putting forth, and I'm sure you understand this, Marissa, it's like when you start playing, it's just it's pretty easy to lose yourself into that um, and not be thinking about anything else um, until, you know, once you're like walking off the stage, then you're back into that uh, reality again. But it's uh, cool when your music can almost move you to a point where like you're not even, you know, present with anything other than that sonic sphere that you're existing in. So that's my really, experience with it. Really cool last second thing, Maddie, because I know you got to go. When yeah. over Christmas, Maddie came home for Christmas for about a week, and we went to see a movie. And right near the, right across from the movie place was a guitar center, the only real guitar place around here. Which is, and it's a crappy one. They don't have, they don't have much as far as good electrics and all that stuff. They kind of, they went from being an A store to a C store, but they have really nice acoustics. How about it, Mad? So we went into the acoustic room, and she sat down. And she started playing some chords. And once I kind of got in groove with what she was doing, she was playing. I forget. Were you playing it? I think you were playing a Taylor. And I picked up the new Martin Cutaway. That It's a 1313, I think they call it. Beautiful guitar. And I just started soloing. And the next thing you know, people are coming in. And they're kind of stopping. And they're looking at us. And, and then they're going out. And then they're coming back in. And it was like, hey, man, we got like a tiny little audience of three or four people here. This is pretty cool. But, I mean, it was just so cool to get to jam with my daughter because, you know, we yeah. really do it. But, um, and the funny thing is, Maddie, I didn't really teach you much. I mean, we've had a couple of moments where I've been like, all right, this is the scale you want to do. And here you want to transition to this chord and stuff. But you've kind of pretty much self-taught yourself except for the one course you took at MTSU. And then you've really self-taught yourself on piano, which is Marissa, you've just learned to kind of play the piano for reals in the last couple of years, right? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> um, yeah, I learned how to read music kind of and oh, wow. like a struggle to get through, but it was really um, pretty magical to be able to like to horribly play a, um, a nocturne or something i mean i'm terrible but it's like it was rewarding to understand um written music for the first time oh i you know? can't do it i can't i'm a good i'm a metal guitar player i can't read music i'm just too dumb but yeah. i i know it's like i can sit down and play the chords to uh keep on loving you by reo speedwagon so i'm yeah. golden i'm golden at a bar yeah. right Mads, thanks so much for popping in. Um, I know you got to get back to work. I'm sorry we goofed on the, the timing thing. I guess you misunderstood me, but um, can't see your okay. eyes. I was, I was able to watch some of the stream beforehand, and I just resonated with so many things, be it the way that you finger pick um, to strumming with your fingernail. <laughs> like, I do the same thing to Leonard Cohen. He's been such a, a blessing to have found uh, in recent years. Um, but yeah, just like really am grateful to be here and having uh, had the opportunity to speak with you and oh, thank you for sharing major. your art with the world Who's the oh, other thank major you so much Maddie? you're so sweet and good luck it's really nice to meet you um yes you too if you're ever in Asheville, for, feel free to connect hey real yeah, quick totally. mads. mads who's your other super huge massive giant huge anic influence tell marissa I would say Jeff Buckley or George Harrison. Jeff Buckley Good and George picks. Harrison. Can't, can't go <laughs> yeah. wrong with those two picks. So, all right, baby, I love, love you so much. I love you so much, and I miss you so much. I miss you, know you too, and have a good rest of your chats. And, okay. Marissa, have a lovely day. You too. So nice to meet you. Bye, guys. See ya. Bye. Thanks, babe. See ya. Bye. Okay. All right. Oh, she's so, so sweet.
Well, thank you very much. I that was such a cool moment for. Her. She just hit me up. She's like, Dad, I misread your text. I thought. I'm like, yeah, I was waiting for you. So how are you doing on time? We're in an hour and 20. Can you go? To- I mean, I could, I could go. Um, can we try to rip through the albums quick? Can we do Yeah, let's rip hour? through the albums. Half um, hour? Can- half hour? Yeah. All right. Yeah, All right, cool. Because I, I think this is going to be a killer interview for you no, to me post. me too. I think people, people will enjoy this. I think they will. I, or so, like a very small amount, but I'm I think they will, you're, you're, I'm it's, pretty you're, self-deprecating if you can't tell. I, uh, can, so. I can tell. And that's, look, I get it. Cause I'm like that too. You know, I, am very much like this very self-deprecating, but your talent, and you say you don't like the word talent. I think, um, <laughs> you're, cause I'm an art teacher. Cause then it like, I was like, oh, you should have heard those first two records. They're terrible. So, like, the ones I never released. Oh, like, the first two. Well, everybody's <laughs> first record sucks. I, I mean, right. And you know what the funny thing is? Probably you're, you're so raw at that point, right? It's so raw and so, you know, I have demos, cassette demos, right? Four-track cassette demos of just some of the worst crap ever. <laughs> and it's like, you know, where I'm still learning out of soul. And then I'll run into that one bit where I did like this monster killer Wawa solo that I'm like, oh shit, how do I, pl- how did I play that? I got to figure out how to play that. Cause that's wicked. That's just how it works when you're learning your craft and you've really learned your craft. We're going to get through that quick here. So little hells, the album is, has a bit of a different feel. Well, um, you said you weren't hearing those instruments. That was more of a production, post-production, pre-production, yeah. or post-production. If you, sort of thing. if you go on Bandcamp, I actually put the demos to that record up because right. and if there are anybody interested, it, it is kind of interesting to hear the songs like and how they changed uh, from demo to the studio. Um, you, but you should mention I, that you have demos for pretty much all the albums from little hell's up right july yeah. uh for my crime uh stranger strangers yeah strangers yeah. um is there one for marissa nadler just a marissa nadler one of the demos so. no yeah, I, I, know, so. I don't think so but i have a pretty extensive demo process and i happen to be more fond of my demos for um little hell's for some reason Okay. I think I just, um, well, that record has a negative association to me now. Um, and I'm just briefly get into it. Like, can you talk um, about it or do you want to? I can. It? I just okay. really quickly, like okay. the record, the record label that it came out on, like name themselves after my song and then drop me from the record label. And, um, so and who it was, was that? like, I'm trying to remember. I didn't write that Mexico. down. Uh, Mexican summer. Oh, that's right. Okay. It's no big deal. Like I happen to be on much, like much. I love the labels that I'm on now, Sacred Bones and Bella Union. And it was a blessing in disguise, but it did mar the album for me because it got really good reviews. And I didn't understand why like a label would do something like that. Like, and even like the village voice, rest in peace. I wrote a whole thing about how, how crazy it was because the you you'd think it would be some kind of job security to have the label like named after your song yeah right so, anyway onwards and upwards like there's a, it's a business you know and i've been a cult musician and so i if you're not making money like i get it so right. this so the demos i like because they're all me and like stripped down and kind of they're a little bit more haunting without the mm-hmm. production so. oh you said the h word i heard it haunting <laughs> i don't dislike the word haunting I, but i'm teasing yeah. you i'm teasing you i um the only stuff i did not listen to and prep for this were the demos i just ran yeah. out of time but well, i listened okay. to every one of your other albums and most of the covers and the brodsky album everything i was like god this is and here's the weird thing. A lot of times when I listen to bands' catalogs to prepare for, like, deep dives, I don't want to ever hear their stuff again. But I actually <laughs> went back and pulled a couple up, like the Brodsky album, uh, For My Crimes, and Strangers in July. Those three albums. Well, no, four albums. Your, your latest four albums are just 
well, we're, yeah. I'm going to talk about them here quick. The uh, latest four albums are the best ones, and that absolutely. it should make people feel that, like, the whole concept of like an artist's first or second record being their best is not true. Like, you not can get case. better. Not, not in your case. Not in a lot of cases. Like. I know some people don't want people to change, but I do think the path of the clouds for a lot of reasons is it's tied with another one for my favorite, but from July strangers for my crimes and the path of the clouds are much to me, much stronger than my early records. So I agree. I like agree. A, I agree. And I really have like a, a tough time. Yeah. I have a tough time picking before I re listen to everything. I probably would have said July. After listening, I was like, oh, wait a minute. Is it for my crimes? Oh, my God. Strangers is really good. And then I get to Path, and I'm like, shit, this album is brilliant. Like, ah, I can't make a decision. So I kind of say your best album is all four of those albums right now. So um, let's talk about them real quick here. Uh, the song Rosary yeah. is a good example of what I was talking about, where perhaps it would have simply, in the past, it would have been simply voice and harmonies and strum finger pick guitar lines. But now you've added elements to make the song form far more dense sonically, uh, yet it still remains pretty deceivingly simplistic. And I don't mean that as a slight. I just mean it. it's it's yeah. a simple song in its basic form that stuff kind of got put onto that make it pretty brilliant. Um, you get really experimental on the track, Mary Comes Alive. Was that track kind of liberating for you to do as it really doesn't sound like anything Mercy Nadler ever did before? And it doesn't sound like anything I ever did again. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I was I didn't want to upset you, but it's my least favorite Marissa Nadler song. <laughs> yeah, it was because at that time I was um, a little bit of a pushover, and mm -hmm. I wasn't in control a, a, in the studio. Um, and ever since then, I have been like more outspoken. So let's just say that, like, I was just still really young and kind of like. Okay, it was such a great drummer. He's right. a blonde redhead drummer. How was I supposed to say no? I was like, such a fan of the band. Sure. You know, it was like a kind of a people pleaser. And you know, as you get older, or or I grew up in a different generation, so like I became more empowered as I got older. Sure. Now I'm like super empowered, but back then I was, I think, too just um, got led astray a little bit. It was probably and, easier to go along to get along sort of kind of thing. Yeah. Um, exactly. And that is a polarizing track because <clears throat> if I go out and read reviews, that's the one track that everybody kind of goes, I don't know what she was trying to do on this track, but it, it's, this kind of ties into another thing. I will profess to be in the latter camp that it's not my favorite track. On, on this particular album yeah. and this album has some killer songs on it as a few that i'm kind of just a little lost yeah. on. like the vibe wasn't there for me so what i wanted to get to was does it bother you or energize you to experiment more when you hear negative feedback <laughs> i mean i'm a pretty sensitive person yeah I, it bothered me back then now i just don't read anything like Back in the day, like the comments on sites like Brooklyn Vegan and Stereo Gum mm -hmm. were absolutely mm -hmm. brutal. Um, anybody that I know that's a peer of mine, that's a woman, went through the same thing. And it was just like a really brutal era of the internet where yeah. like hipster runoff and these like crazy um, standards that you would be held up to, your appearance being torn apart and like, just I don't like miss that era at yeah. all. Yeah. Um, like now I see that people can comment again, but it's not as like cool to be mean on the internet. Um, <laughs> and I never understood why anybody would want to be mean or what yeah. the point of writing a negative review at all is. Like I personally have weird feelings about like music reviews at this point, but it's because they have had so much power in my career. Yeah. You know? I don't, um, I don't think they have the same level of power anymore. Do you? No, they don't. Because and actually no. the one good thing about streaming and Instagram and uh, TikTok is that it empowers like the every voice, like 
that everybody can have everybody their own opinion. opinion. Yeah. And it, that's a better thing than having a monopoly on opinion. Um, exactly. I mean, so. I have an opinion and I'm doing this show and essentially I, I, I say you have no bad albums. But this is probably my least favorite album that you did. And it's not, hmm. it's not because of the experimentation and sort of a change in direction and sound somewhat. It's yeah. just, there's some there's some sharp turns on here that the vibe just isn't there for me and mm -hmm. that's just a personal taste thing you know as you know bob dylan did a lot of shitty albums too let's be honest uh <laughs> brian wilson every songwriter has oh, done yeah. some albums that just don't hold up and like you said being held up to ridiculous standards the crazy thing with you though is marissa you went over and above as you continued on your craft improved so let's let's do that let's move on to um and because you kind of answered the, the one question i had you know how do you deal with reviews and possibly negative stuff but you become a seasoned veteran and i think you say hey you don't really like reading them and b if you do get a negative one do you let it kind of Roll off your back and say, ah, fuck that guy. Pardon my language, but I do use that. Exactly. Word. I mean, now I am. It's like, who gave you the, who made you the arbiter of good taste? Exactly. Like, I mean, it's ridiculous. Like, there were so many years where I lived in fear of, like, pitchfork and stuff. I mean, luckily, they reviewed all my albums very positively. Yes, it did. Almost all of them. But it was like that was so important for an era and it wasn't really fair because it didn't, I know some friends of mine that got like destroyed by that website and then they stopped playing music. Like yeah. there yeah. never be like, especially with like, if you don't a lot of, I mean, nothing against these websites, but they had too much power for a time. And I think uh, not in a good way, but yeah. I um, mean, anyway, it's yeah. You're right. That 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 point you made about friends that were musicians that put something out and got destroyed and just said, hey, you know what, well, fuck this. I'm not doing this. It's not worth it's not worth the emotional stra stress and the anxiety and the, you know, the the internal strife that might cause you to have because you're looking inward and saying, well, I'm not good enough. These people are saying I'm not good enough and this is all shit. So I should just give it up and, you know, go wait tables or whatever. And that's that's a not a cool place to be, you know. I agree with you 100 percent um standout tracks on little hell which is, is has a lot of beautiful songs on it ghosts and lovers man which uses the dreaded haunting word by the way in the chorus <laughs> um brittle crushed and torn has some really cool guitar melodies and is a more typical Mar marissa nadler, nadler nadler vocal but the real standout track for me is loner that's a really cool droney theremin weirdness and lots of reverb that saturates and, and in the spaces and the track it's super atmospheric and trippy that's a very different sound for you how's that track hold up for you you it's hate all right. it no i don't hate it i mean i don't play anything off this record anymore okay. ever it's just just a bad because it was just because it reminds me of like a painful thing that happened um yeah. Yeah. to me and it, it made me almost quit music and doubt myself for years like so that's why but anyway i came back so much stronger like just goes to show you you have to let, have perseverance and um so after that i started my own little imprint and right. did the self-titled record you did um, i had one quick note on the the last track though mistress that's yeah. the track that i really hear some dark side of the moon on there there's a there's a line in there that's very da, 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 yeah. it's really cool it's 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 almost like i'm sure you did it accidentally but and it's not exact don't get me wrong but it's a very it's just got that cool melody in there and really cool track so you did um in between there real quick you did a song with zaster you did the thing with scott connor it wasn't a song it's an entire album oh you did the whole album yeah um portal of sorrow oh, yeah yeah i i didn't know you did that whole album um i mean you oh. can't really hear me on all the songs but i'm on more than a few of the songs and so i was living in Ritz. los, los angeles at the time and i went over his apartment and did the vocals and 
Yeah, he's how that happened? Friend. Like, how did it come about? He was a fan of my music. Um, he loves folk, like he likes finger picking. And yeah, in recent years, he's gone mostly acoustic. Actually, yeah, he's got that um, weird project. What's it called? Lurker, not Lurker, Chalice. Um, Lurker Chalice is Jeff Whitehead Leviathan. I know the name of it. I can't. Maybe I'll think of it. Yeah, it's all acoustic stuff like that. It's pretty good. Yeah, pretty cool stuff. Um, self title comes out June fourteenth on two thousand eleven. You. Put it out on your imprint, right? Box of Cedars. Yeah. And uh, you yeah. also use Kickstarter, which for the first and I guess yeah. only time, and you raised, I don't know, it says 17 grand, but who cares? You raised money for this album uh, to put it together. And how successful was a uh, successful adventure was that? Because, you know, later on, some of those, these self-funding things started to steal money from artists. It, um, I think that was early days. This was the very early days of Kickstarter, actually. I was one of the first um, artists like to fund a record like that. Um, it was it was a pretty good experience because it gave me like hope that people still liked my music, um, <laughs> or at least like enough to support it. And um, and then I used it was interesting because I had learn the ins and outs of running a label uh, imprint mm -hmm. like i had dist a distributor i worked with the manufacturers and all that stuff um but it just generally like i don't go spend my whole life writing songs and working on my art to be a secretary like i don't yeah it was too much admin work and even yeah. nowadays it's a lot of admin work um but yeah so for band camp you mean for band camp for everything oh okay admin. all of it all the so the social media pressure yeah. kind of stuff like I've, I've taken a little bit if you notice like i was i'm gonna post this afterwards because i just get anxiety about yeah. social media like most people it's um yeah o i got you i got you i totally get you i <laughs> i understand you i know it, it's weird you maybe you pick up on it maybe you don't but i'm a little adhd like my head <laughs> is kind of running in a million directions but I can usually channel it. But I will tell you that lifelong sufferer of anxiety, and one of the major problems I had with trying to perform was I'd get up on stage and I'd literally be like, I got to have a drink or I got to have, I got to take yeah. a pill or something like that. Yeah. And that wasn't, it wasn't worth it to me. I'm a good guitar player and I'm a decent songwriter. My daughter will tell you that, but I'm, I'm terrified of getting in front of people yet. I'm doing this, you know what I mean? So it's kind of yeah. weird. It's kind of a strange thing. But um, let's talk about some of the quick songs here. The Sun Always Reminds Me of You is so gorgeous. The Lap Steel hits right here. What was the influence or impetus for this one? Because it's a really almost a warm old school country song. Yeah. It's just beautiful. It's exactly what it is. It's a, it's a country song. It's, mm -hmm. um, I love old country songs where you have this like very universal theme. Um, and I think this is like where I started to in general write songs with more universal themes when I discovered that like I think early on in my career I like intentionally tried to be as um Obscure. Un unrelatable and obtuse as yeah. possible like every um weird art school kid you know and I was just didn't even want anybody to listen that was right, right, <laughs> right, right. so yeah I mean I just a reluctant or a reluctant artist right yeah so I wanted to um to start writing songs that like that's the beauty of music is that it connects people um so yeah that song was i went back to brian mcteer at um minor street studios who did the second record right. I, I tend mm -hmm. to i tend to be pretty loyal like i yeah. hang around I hang on to people for a long time so right, right. he he was like super psyched to do this and I did a not like the little EP after this one with him as well. The sisters EP. Yeah. Yep. I'm going to talk about that quick because it's absolutely stellar. I love that EP. Um, both. You have two EPs. I if, guess. I, I mean, I don't know. If you, <laughs> it depends on what you count as an EP, but I think the, this one and wrath of the clouds, man, wrath of the clouds. I got a lot, I got a lot to say about that EP. <laughs> it's so good um so yeah this uh baby i will leave you while it's lyrically a sad song it's super lush and gorgeous and again feels like a release from something super heavy 
it just has that release feeling of I'm, I'm breaking whatever bonds are in my head or physical bonds or whatever. Uh, the song is truly one of your best songs, and that's saying something. Is it autobiographical lyrically or is it an allegorical tale? Um, I don't really remember. Um, <laughs> I think it was it was an exercise in um, modulating, like musically. I was I remember like where I was when I wrote the song more than the inspiration behind it. Like I remember mm -hmm. sitting on my floor in Jamaica Plain um on sheridan street like it was i used to drink wine i don't anymore drink mm -hmm. anymore at all but back in the day i was like that record i think i was writing like wine writing <laughs> <laughs> so a little bit of buzz writing here that's cool though sometimes that yeah but this album i know july is a real heavy one for you uh like you can speak that in a minute. Was this a breakup album too, or was this a good period? Because the weird thing about this, and by good, I, I mean happy period, um, as opposed to going through relationship strife or life strife. But the, the reason I say that is that this album has an unusually upbeat, happy feel to it, like a warm, sunny day in the autumn before it gets cold. It just feels, it's like a feel good listening experience. Yeah. How do you feel about this album in retrospect? And did you do any touring on this one? I've toured all the records, but okay. yeah, self titled record um, was not a heartbreak or breakup record. Yeah, it was like your instincts are right, spot on about that. Um, I I don't know. I, this one still feels a long, like a long, it's been such a long career. I, that was so long ago that I don't really like i might need more time away from the early work like only recently have i be, been able to uh, like appreciate some of the early stuff like for instance that leonard cohen cover of famous blue raincoat is the first thing that pops up on spotify is it really Spotify's algorithm is just so messed up that like yeah. if people put it on playlists like it just and it is so frustrating to me as an artist that I've like put out so much strong work since then, since um, almost 20 years ago at this point. And it, we can't like control what pops up when somebody looks you up. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, so I keep watching it and couldn't have done the killing is slow, like slowly creeping slowly up. Gonna edge it up. Yeah. Killer like, song too. Um, a quick aside there. <laughs> I do these little shorts where I come up and I have like the background is whatever. I did one for you. I didn't try to lip sync to it. I wanted just the feel of, I think I used, um, was it a dream? I think, I think, yeah. I'm not sure. But anyway, I just kind of creep in and sort of look eerily at the, at the camera and kind of do the, you know, just get into the music thing. But on other ones, I'll lip sync to them. Right. So I've done yeah. a couple of these to like metal band, like nevermore. And, uh, -huh all kinds of metal bands and things like that. But the funniest thing is I did one the other night last week to uh low down by Boz Skaggs. You know that song, right? Mm -mm. You don't know. Oh my goodness. Um, to the dirty low down. You know that song, Marissa. You, you have, I'll to, have to, I'll have to check it out. You're going to check that song. out. Anyways, I lip sync to it. It's a seventies, late seventies sort of classic AOR song. I have almost 5,000 views on that, whereas my interviews get two, three, 500. It's like, what the hell is wrong with people? I know what's wrong with people. The, the attention span's not there. That's It is It's very true that the attention spans have shrunk. Uh, you can even look at like how, if you go on Bandcamp, you can look to see how many people make it through your songs. <laughs> like, yeah, they get, they get and, like, 20 seconds in or two minutes in and they're, they're they're bouncing that just does not i don't understand that at all it's um, enlightening yeah let's uh let's move on to the cp quickly here um i just had one more where are you at there we are this had one more note on oh i'd real quick it's it'd be good to note that and i did not include these because there was too many of them but the covers albums you did four covers albums or is it five I have no idea. Just you're not sure. They were okay. like in. I think it's informal. four. Yeah. I think it's four, and the 
your first one came out in 2010, which I again I think was just an internet exclusive. I don't know the, if there was actual physical media for that. I, I couldn't find any. I used to um, all the covers records. I used to like for, make my own little CDRs to sell okay. shows, and I sold them through Etsy um, ah, back in the okay. day. Yeah. Um, the first one you got songs by Sammy Smith, Saunders Ferry Lane, which you then redo later, and it's just such. A beautiful song that I never had heard before. It's so cool. Yeah. Um, you got the Lemonheads, Drug Buddy, which is, I'd never heard that song. That's a cool song, too. Weird title, obviously. Yeah. Chris Christopherson, My Sunday Morning. Plus, you got a bunch of Towns Van Zant, And you are a Towns Van Zant lover, I do believe. Um, mm. And and so that was the first one. Then we get, again, it's, you, you did Poncho and Lefty on there, my favorite town, Towns, well, one of my favorite Towns Van Zant. Um it's a very eclectic set. What sort of criteria do you use to pick a cover? Is it just simply, I love that song. I'm going to do a rearrangement. Basically. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, especially if I'm having trouble writing and I'm feeling guilty about my work ethic or something, I'm like, uh, uh, maybe I always wanted to cover this song because it's, you can learn a lot about songwriting by seeing other people's music. It's kind of like copying a master painting. Like in yeah. uh, for art activity. So you reimagine them though. Very very few of them are like by the numbers exactly like the song. Um, yeah. Is there a is there a process you go through to figure that out, or is it just you find your way through the song and what works works, and that's what you stick with? I'm guessing. Yeah, it's it's more um, an organic. Pro- it's organic, like. Uh, my style just like kind of guides itself, I think. Um, so you've done three or four. We're not sure. I think it's three. Yeah. I think it's four, actually. But one is like an official release, right, that came out in 2021. That's like a physical release through Sacred Bones or no? I don't think um, any of the covers are or like physical releases. Um, yeah, I thought the one was for some reason. Um, I'd have to go back and check. Yeah, I, put, I think I wrote the name down. I can't remember what the heck it's called. Um, I'll leave the it. light on. No. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. So that's that, actually that? mostly demos um, and stuff. Okay. I think those are mostly originals. There might be a cover or two on there or something. Okay, I probably got a little confused. I don't own the physical or. A physical. I'm kind of a physical guy because I come from that era. I like yeah. to have, like something tactile to hold. Oh, um, okay. Real quick on covers, then we'll move on. Uh, I was young when I left home. Is the ultimate bummer Dylan song, it, but it's so beautiful, and your rendition of it is just man. It's it's a heavy, heavy, heavy song. What made you pick that one? Because that's a pretty obscure Dylan yeah. song, I would say. I love that song, and I heard um, it kind of came out late in on one of the bootleg series, and I just couldn't get it out of my head, and it was in a similar guitar style as to how I kind of play, so um, yeah. I think the covers got a lot better as well, like, oh, that's yeah. why I redid the Sammy Smith song, was because, like, my guitar skills were just not up to par back then, or yeah. my vocals, or weren't it ever like the early work my voice wasn't there as much as the writing it because maybe because i was so shy i like didn't do chorus or whatever <laughs> yeah no i mean um sisters ep comes out may 29 2012 it's another gorgeous set of tracks with an unusual it leads off with an unusual kind of track though um the wrecking ball company is kind of a marissa nadler blues song do you agree with me or not? Because it's got a little bit of a blues. It's got a bluesy seventh yeah. chord. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Which is weird because that's not your normal. That's not your normal thing, but it's a it's a great track. Apostle, man, what a oh, what a beautiful track that is. And also, where's that? Where's that? I lost it. Um, Constantine, another just gorgeous, gorgeous, beautiful tracks. I, I keep saying every time I was writing, I'm like, this is my favorite track. Wait a minute. You wrote that was your favorite track up there. So I got like 25 favorite Marissa Nadler tracks. I <laughs> That's um, sweet. One more quick thing on the, um, the, the covers thing. 
while I was writing all this out, I had a couple covers in mind for you. And one, the first sure. one, the first one, are you familiar with the band Wasp? No. Okay. Wasp. W-A-S-P. They're a metal band out of L.A. from the 80s. Check out the song Wild Child. Man, okay. I think you could destroy that song. It's, it would be so cool to hear you do a take on that. That's one. I have another one down further here uh, we're getting to. Um, the Sisters thing, was that kind of a stopgap to the July album just to put some material out? Because were you in contract negotiation? <laughs> um, no. It wasn't. It was it was uh, songs written in the same time as the self-titled thing. Okay. And they were like leftovers, basically. Um, and then I like quit music for a bit, basically. Um, I got a job teaching at this school called Granite Academy, which is a, a therapeutic high school for special needs kids. And I was just kind of like disillusioned with the industry, the music industry. And um wasn't really sure. It's interesting that like my best work came after that break. Uh, yes. Or at least like, what I think. But um, yeah, I was teaching almost full time, uh, mostly fine art, but some recording and um, music as well. But like you, speaking of recording, do you have like a Pro Tools set up at your place, or what do you what do you now? Do? I do. Um, do? Okay. I learned how to use Pro Tools for the path of the clouds. I was using logic for logic. about yep. five or six, 10 years before that. And then for that garage band, before that four tracks, you know, yeah. uh, tape recorders, boom boxes. Um. <laughs> Man, you are old now. No, I'm just kidding. Yep. <laughs> we go back so, to that. And I mean, people don't realize now digital recording changed everything because unfortunately, the truth of the matter is back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, when you went in to record stuff, you had to have it down. You had to have it rehearsed. Studios cost money. Tape costs yeah. money. And if you're not nailing it in the first couple of takes, you are wasting a lot of people's times. I mean, guys like Miles Davis and John Coltrane, you know, that was real musicianship. Now today, you hear a lot of these metal bands, and they're just cut, cutting and pasting stuff. It's lost a lot of its soul to me. And, and that's the one thing, especially in metal, not your kind of music, not your niche. And, you know, people that are really true artists looking to expand the boundaries of music. But I, I have a tough time with the, the, the digital thing. But it makes everybody can become a recording artist. You know, it's like. Which is really empower. It's pretty yeah, cool at the same time. It is. Like, it's it's been a learning curve. Like I'm still getting better at pro tools and it's um, all of it. That's the cool things it can do, but I, I enjoy it as a woman um, because I, I like like to be in control in the production chair or, or I like um, being able to not have to rely on anybody else. Like not to say I won't, I mean, I've worked with plenty of producers, but I like being able to know how to do it myself as well. Right. Yeah. But you and you self-produced the last album, which we're get, we're getting to here fairly quickly. I'm, I'm going to try to get you out of here real soon. Um, the, <laughs> this is your this is the album <laughs> I came back to Marissa Nadler, and mm -hmm. I have to tell you, you know, this album for a very long time was my favorite, and it always is right. Yeah. Then, like I said, then these these last four albums you've got have just it is your best work. Um, the uh, and that sisters EP, by the way, folks, that's one to grab too. That's an amazing album. I um I was just immediately blown away by the melancholy, sad beauty of this album. Came out February fourth, twenty fourteen, on Sacred Bones, which is the label that you're still in Bella Union. Yeah, um, both of them. Yeah, because Bella Union's for Europe and UK, right? And yeah. And then Sacred Bones is U.S. Um, the Bella Union does um, everything but the U.S. Because, like, they do Asia as well. Oh, okay. Um, Sacred Bones is, like, North America. And um, I love both of the labels. They've been super supportive um, through all these four records, all these projects. Oh, yeah, because I think you're 
the promotion for them is good because there's a lot more visibility, I think, in the last six or seven years. Um, but that uh, also has to do with, like, the Internet itself. Yeah, that's think. true. That's, um, a good point. that's a good point. Although, you know, you, I found out about you in the Internet back way back, way back in the yeah. early 2000s. So it was there. But um, I, I'm immediately struck here. I hear almost a romanticized seductive sort of siren like quality the way you're delivering your vocal melodies on this this whole um uh, it's not that there's a massive change but there is to me a perceptible change did you change something in the production did you because they're very eerily seductive and haunting was there something that ramble done and you did differently with the vocals on this album and going forward kind of well there there was something different about the writing for this record <clears throat> excuse me like I spent forever writing the harmonies mm -hmm. for this. Like I had the parts for drive, like demoed. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Randall's like a master of atmosphere, you know? Oh my God. He's yes. So good at what he does. And absolutely. Um, yeah. So it was like a really great match, but I, I, really worked very, very diligently on the demo process and came in because I felt like I had a lot of, to prove. I got signed to these two great new labels and I wanted to like give it my all, you know, mm -hmm. and work with this great new producer. And there are, it is, I worked like in a different capacity on like trying like and the early records, I would be like, all right, I guess it's done. Like, that's a song. Right. <laughs> and then th this one, I like really tore them apart, put them back together, um, and and started or like my work ethic went to an another level, I think. So. Do you think this is the album where the pivotal sort of change in your uh, style definitely. happened with this album? Without a doubt. I yeah it's a special one for me just like it's kind of like my the childhood like not childhood but like this is like my if you, you know um, is it your grown-up record it's like god if i i wouldn't do this to to anybody but like if i could have i don't know what i'm trying to say you know some people can have erased their entire back catalogs and like just like recreated themselves I wouldn't okay. do that because the early work is special in its own right. But it like is. I yeah. could, I this one is my very close to my heart um, for a lot of reasons. So there's a great uh, set of players on this album too, like Avon King on the strings, really I next say, level. I had a note on that the strings are beautiful on this album, and they're more pronounced than they ever were. And was that Randall's? Just you and you and Randall working together on what you wanted to hear there, or we we had a great time in the studio. He was really excited to work on this and had a lot of great um, players. And he picked the players, except for uh, like my friend Phil. I picked uh, him to play some guitar. Yeah, was this but... the first album Milky played on? Or was that the next one? Next one. Next one. Okay. I thought so. And I want you to speak about him quickly. Sure. Let me hit some quick points on this drive. Okay. Man, what a beautiful song. Um, is there a story behind this? Because on a personal side, when I'm upset, anxious, stressed, depressed, my head can't get right. The one thing I do generally before I got ill, really ill, is get in my car and drive. I'll go out in the country. I'll go up by the river. I'll just disappear, you know, for and drive for a half an hour, 45 minutes to kind of that hum of the road that maybe put some tunes in and just sort of disconnect from all the shit storm that might be back here. Is that what the song's about? Or is there something more? Cause the lyrics are very, they're very esoteric. They're not really like specific <laughs> any uh, one thing. Well, uh, sorry, I'm rambling. Oh, it's okay. Um, Like back to those classic country songs, like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I became more and more in love with these grand statements of um, universal choruses. Right. And I was exercising between like contrasting the minutia of daily life with um, like a big relatable chorus. 
Um, yeah. So like the details in the verses are very much like autobiographical details, specific details. And then the chorus is something I think um, most people can relate to. So I yeah. was um, playing with like big and small uh, as a writer, I guess. Um, yeah. And they're but kinda, yeah. the verses are kind of abstract though. You can't really pinpoint exactly what you're, not what you're trying to say, but it's, it's very nebulous. You could affix any kind of meaning to it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, Dead City Emily, was it a dream? Man, wow, what a banger, one-two punch. Just, I love Dead City Emily. That's just such a beautiful song. And Was It a Dream was the first song I heard off this album. I think I heard it like on like a satellite radio thing, believe it or not, like NPR. I think it was yeah. NPR. And I just was like, whoa, that sounds like, and this is why how I came back in. I'm like, that sounds like Marissa Nadler. And I went home and Googled it. I'm like, oh, shit. She's got a new album out. Oh, got to go get this album. I remember I was living with my ex, Catherine, at the time. I'm like, I got to play for something for you. As soon as I got home, I said, I've got to play this for you. She liked it. She wasn't as blown away as I just kept <laughs> raving about it. And I'm like, Funny. We're, we're going to see her in Philadelphia the minute. And, of course, I found out you'd already played by that time. And I missed yeah. it. It happened a lot. But um, just uh, it's, oh, it's just chillingly beautiful. I like to think they're both devastatingly melancholic but both hopeful. Your ghostly vocals are insane on both those uh, tracks. I wanted to ask you a little bit about tunings because I know I saw a little video of you. Forget who it was with. You were with a guy – couple years ago yeah it was um uh boston herald yeah. uh judd yeah that's, um, that's it you were talking about d minor open tuning and so of course i immediately dropped my guitar into d minor tuning i'm like you know she's right this is just such a killer key to write in to, and to sing in and you know what it reminded me of and i hope you're old enough i think you are spinal tap d minor yeah, the saddest key. The saddest yeah. key. Lick my love pump. <laughs> it's like I was like, damn, she's writing in D minor, the saddest key. Um, you like to play in alternate tunings. Was there a lot of that on this album? Yeah. Um pretty uh let's see, anyone else? Um 1923 Drive, uh Dead City Emily are all in open tunings. Um mm -hmm. Drive is just one string open or, or two strings, like the E's or D to D. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 1923 is a different tuning. Yeah, I love open tunings. That's like the Joni Mitchell influence. She well, was I was going to ask you, and here's the other cover I had an idea for. <clears throat> one artist I'd never really hear you talk about in print or in on screen or wherever you've done interviews is a guy who made a very short life, but he made a living out of really weird and alternate tunings. And that is Nick Drake. Are I you am. a Nick, are you a Nick Drake fan? <clears throat> I am a Nick Drake fan. Like, um, he was, he was not an influence because he didn't really rise to popularity until that Volkswagen commercial. Exactly. Or, and so I didn't grow up listening to him, but I went, he, he became popular. I love his music and um I like his mother's music too, Molly Drake, who is like some haunting kind of Connie Converse ish kind of stuff. I didn't know right. her, his mother sang. Oh wow, I did not know that. Whoa, okay. Did she, you get yeah. any of the tunings from him or is the open tunings or the different tunings things you learn from the other musicians you're hanging around? Or other songs. It was actually um, through people like Jack Rose, um, mm -hmm. Glenn Jones, who is an, another incredible player. Um, hung out with a lot of these, like uh, James Blackshaw. Did uh, my first year, one of my first UK tours with him. So I was in that scene where, like, with the American primitive, is like I guess the term the, used to describe that style of like fehi uh basho other uh, you know real yeah so yeah that's where i got into open <laughs> tunings from and i mean a lot of those guys stole a lot of that from jimmy page and 
you know, the early guys that were using the, you know, like, like the droning strings and stuff like that's really cool. Um, Close of Sand. Have you heard that song? No. You've got to listen to that song because I think it's perfect for you. Just such an incredibly, incredibly intensely beautiful song. That's Nick Drake. Um, okay. Oh, so I might know of, it. I just don't know the title of it. You may. Um, okay. You may know it. It's a weird tuning. Actually, my guitar's in it. It's um, it's uh, standard. So you have a you have a double A. Okay. Uh, I'm goofing it up. So I'm I'm a little nervous playing in front of you, but oh I, no, it sounds great. One of these days I'll 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 send you something. But um, so that's one you should check out. A lot of pro critics called this your strongest album to date. Looking back in perspective, how do you feel? I think you already talked about that. You love this album. It's really important to you. Um, did you do a lot of touring on this one too? I really did a lot of touring on every single album. I've been <laughs> work. Yeah, so I did tour this um, pretty strongly. Yeah. Well, this this um, would you say that your following is bigger in Europe though than in the states? Um, it's it really depends on like what part of the states we're talking about. Like, I can I'm I'm pretty much a cult musician everywhere, but um, yeah. like. Yeah, I do really well in certain countries, um, like England or yeah. Turkey, actually. Oh, really? at all. Um, yeah. I, like, Italy was really good on this last tour. It really depends. But you go to, like, some of the middle of the U.S., and I could, like, play to three people Nobody still shows this up. far into my career. And that's fine. Like... It is like what, what? It is. Seattle, Seattle, LA, New York, Philly. Yeah, like the major, yeah, the major coastal cities. And well, not Chicago's not on the coast, but yeah, major cities I do are all right, I guess, you know. Mm -hmm. But that's mm -hmm. the thing is, I've never aspired to be a pop star, or no, rock I got star you. so I'm actually cool with it. Um, when you played, all right, we've, when we've you played got, on the ghost tour, was that? terrifying for you to go out on those stages with the the bigger audiences like that yeah it wasn't like the first time because i had done some opening tours with like all sorts of big bands but that was the biggest and the scariest because i was the main support and I, like yeah it was terrifying at first but i you know it ended up going all right did um what's his name Tobias. Tobias, did he request you to be the opener? Wow. That's... Yeah, he actually heard my music at a record store and that's badass. Wrote my name down and yeah, it was it was cool. Um, like, it, I got a lot of internet hate on that uh, tour. Like, but I just have developed a thicker skin, so nothing really just bothers just, me. The funny thing is that as a metalhead, all the metalheads can't really stand ghosts because they're kind of a pop band you're a metal band that's pop i he writes great songs don't get me wrong and i've seen him twice saw him open for maiden and open for uh opeth and you know they're good they're, they put on a great stage show they're kind of a 70s they're kind of like blue oyster cult for me exactly they're not yeah. i felt like more goth and metal yeah just yeah. in terms of subject matter but oh, yeah. it's it's like well they put that they put the stage show on and it's it's a good say. It's Kiss, you know. It's Kiss of the 2010s or whatever. Um, it was a fun tour, though. The people that were in the band were really nice. Rest um, in peace. Sorry, <laughs> my my sorry. roommate popped in on me that quick. Okay. I'm gonna hurry. I know you want to get out of here. Um, oh, it's not the, like you know. Um, we had, there's just a lot of records to cover. <laughs> yeah, we're almost, <laughs> I'm, done. I'm, we're almost done. I'm gonna make it quick. Um, for my uh, we have. For my crowd. No, we were at I'm having a good time though. You did your research and this is fun. It's like it's all good. Yeah. Tell you what, I promise I'm gonna get you out of here in 20 minutes. I promise. Okay. okay. We're gonna move quick. Uh strangers, I was not I said I followed you religiously. I missed this album somehow. 
And I got to be honest with you, I just listened to it yeah. two or three days ago. And I got to say, wow, this is kind of the companion piece to July in a lot of ways. There's a lot of, I don't say it's the same. It's just a great companion piece. Yeah. Um, you know, the album starts out, the, the quad of Skyscraper, Hungry is the Ghost, All the Colors, Strangers. is just incredible and may rival the best tracks on July. So it's, you're going from strength to strength. Ghosts and Strangers are like the swirling collage of ear candy that are among your best pieces, Marissa. They're, they're so beautiful. Again, this is Randall Dunn, right? And this is where Milky starts to play uh, on record with you and then, I guess, go out on tours with you, right? Yeah. Um, talk about Milky and what he's brought to the palette of your writing, maybe, and maybe not the your writing specifically, but how yeah. you may be thinking about how something's going to translate live and what he's done in the live setting. Yeah. And I've seen him, and he really, it's perfect. You guys just work so well together. He is a great player, you know. Um, we met on Strangers, and he was very patient um, with, like, me trying to say, no, I hear this line, and, you know, um, great in the studio, and um, also great on stage, like, really good stage presence, and, like, a lot of has a lot of experience with um, that kind of stuff. So... Uh How'd you meet he, him? Like, did Randall bring him Randall in? Randall okay. introduced me to Milky. Um, Re, uh, Milky was is in uh, was in a long term project with Randall, a oh, okay. band called um, Master Musicians. I'm not gonna like say the whole band name. Oh, uh, the B um, word? Is it the B word? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I do know. In that band, I didn't know he um, was. I didn't know he was in that band. That's wild. And yeah, I do know um, their music. It's pretty crazy. It's pretty good stuff. Yeah, so that's how and Milky played on a lot of Randall Randall's productions and tons of other records. And so he contributed a lot to Strangers. Um that's how I met him. Um just the first day of the studio, actually. Oh, wow. Um Randall was like, You gotta hear this producer. I mean, sorry, this guitar player. And I was like And he's been okay. out with you. Pretty much every tour then since right yeah um he he does not play on for my crimes interestingly okay, okay. um but then he plays a ton on the path of the cloud oh, like yeah. that was a, a lot of collaboration between the two of us and his playing really is beautiful on that record and um and yeah like <clears throat> i think um Strangers is a really bleak record. I was pretty depressed when I wrote that album, and I, <laughs> I think it shows. Um, like my inspiration was out, uh, like was in a strange place. Yeah, my notes I wrote: Strangers seems to be more abstract and allegorical as far as telling other characters' stories. Yeah, was that simply because you'd kind of emptied the emotional and spiritual cedar chest on the last album kind of i think that's a pretty astute observation yeah i mean i was also writing in a different method i i i felt like i couldn't really top july in the de confessional department and so mm -hmm. why not try something different and that's when i used the cut up method and stuff like that for the writing process but um yeah i it I also was just um, making, I made some really cool videos. The one for all the colors of the dark. I'm really proud of that video. It's like stop yeah. motion animation. Um, yep, it's cool. All your yeah. videos are cool. All your videos have this. <clears throat> well, this is a good segue. They have, a lot of your videos have kind of a Twin Peaks feel to them in a lot of ways. And speaking of ten, Twin Peaks, around this time, Sacred Bones put a collection of uh, Twin Peaks songs out for the return when when the series came back on. Did they ever approach you about putting a song on, or did you? Because it seems like that would have been a perfect match. I didn't remember. Did they release it? Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Well, Says um, Zaker Bones released an album of soundtrack songs from 
Twin Peaks to return. We and I just said, were you ever approached to write something or have oh, something well, included? No, not on that yeah. project. But I did recover a David Lynch song with Milky um, called. Um, sorry, I'm just drawing a blank right now. But that that came out for Sacred yeah, Bones. Yeah, I, I saw it. I don't remember the name of it either. I apologize, but um, <laughs> it's hard to remember all your covers because you got a lot of cool covers. We didn't mention the fact that you cover Sabbath. Danzig, King Crimson, you do Moonchild. I'm doing a big King Crimson thing on oh, cool. Saturday, which is going to be, I got all that Crimson to jam in my brain in the next three days. Um, luckily, I've seen him a bunch of times. I kind of know Gavin Harrison from Porcupine Tree, obviously. Um, yeah, it's just the, the, the breadth of who you're covering is pretty amazing. But you did listen to a lot of Prague, and you're very schooled and going back and listening to old folk singers and old country singers yeah um gonna try to get out of here quick here get to let's get to um for my crimes which comes out 9 28 2018 sacred bones again i was super stoked to hear where you would go next and of course you didn't disappoint opening with the spooky title track which all right i'm gonna say it again and i think i mean it this time for my crimes is my favorite marissa nadler song there's something what? So intense about that song. It is so, I got to tell you, that song, it can bring me to tears. It really can. And that's not, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an emotional dude, but I don't rarely connect with music that intensely. And I listened to it the other night and going through what I'm going through, it's, it's one thing. But man, that song had me like welling up and there's the plain and finger pick guitar melody and the terrifying cello. I mean, it's just dun, 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 dun. It's just so epic sounding. It, but it, it reads like a dead man walking song about regret, loss, emptiness of the soul. Although I've read it's about forgiveness. Was there a particular thing in, you had in mind <coughs> for the album? Yeah, I mean, the song was like, it's a long story, but um it was again with this universal like well it was from the point of view of somebody on death row was the songwriting prompt that i was given mm -hmm. um like but you, when i wrote it i was excited because i realized that it didn't really come across that way necessarily and it could just be this universal like concept of um human stuff but, what was that sound? Can you hear me? You all right? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I think my did my ears die. No, you're good. Well, I, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you in one ear now. Okay. okay. Um, we'll move quick here. Um, you moved away from Randall Dunn on this. Um, oh, also you had Angel Olsen on here. That's one of my. That's one of Maddie's favorites, by the way. Oh yeah, um, I love so, Angel. Oh, what you, your harmonies together? Otherworldly. Um, you Angel and I go way back, actually. Oh, do you? 2006. Um, we, she's younger yeah. than you, though, right? Yep. Um, yeah. She's She opened for me at this tiny bar in Chicago. It was one of her first shows, and um, we've been friends ever since. And uh, she sings on this. Sharon Van Etten is also on this record. Another um, one that I love. And... Well, actually, let's Kristen. talk about that. It's all women on this album, with the exception of the two producers and uh, the sax sax player, I believe. Yeah, from Morphe. Dana. Dana. Dana from Morphe. Yeah, right. Um, what what was the thought process behind this decision making an empowering feminine musical statement like this? Because it's very powerful. I mean, this album yeah, well, is so good. I wanted um. It was intentional. I mean, I don't want to get into like why, but mm -hmm. I'll say that it was. It, I am a firm believer in like women supporting each other, and as opposed to like sometimes like, it, it, which is becoming more popular now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, but there was a time where it wasn't really like that, you know. Yeah, so. well, other women shit on other women just to get the upper, you know. She looks horrible in those jeans. She's so ugly. I'm so beautiful. That kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, like so, I just picked my favorite, my some of my favorites, and because I've been doing this so long, like I, like was lucky to share in also. Oh, 
now you now I I I think your mic went off. You should be able to hear me if you just go to the settings and go to the computer screen. We'll wrap up here shortly. I'm not hearing you talk because your your mic is muted, and I don't know if that happened because your earbuds went out. Look in the private chat. Hold on. Hello? Hey, there you are. Can you hear me? Yep, yep. I think that your earbuds were the, the audio source. We'll rip through this quick. We're almost there. Um, you moved away from Randall Dunn. Was there a reason for that? You went with um, Justin Raisin and Lawrence Rothman. And you also, I think... Is this the first album you recorded exclusively in California? I don't know. Lost her. Well, hang on a minute, guys. Hey, hey. Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah, you're fine. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, okay. we're going to wrap it up. <laughs> we'll, wrap it up. we'll wrap it up here real quick. We got It's to... only because I have a lesson to teach. Yep, so. yep. No problem, no problem. Um, lessons. For so me. you stepped away from Randall Dunn. Was there a big reason you just wanted to try something different? And was this the first album you recorded in, in California exclusively? Yeah, it was. Um... Well, your video. Oh, there you I'm are. Here, I'm here, here yeah. I mean, I just wanted to try something new, and um, Lawrence had just made a record with Angel, um, the one with Shut Up, Kiss Me, and Hold Me Tight, and I really liked the production on that, and Lawrence um, reached out to me, and I just thought, why not try something different, and uh, also love that area, like Los Angeles, so. Oh, yeah. Um, Would you like to live there? I, don't I, think have, I, I have lived in L.A. You have lived in L.A., okay. I think I like to visit there. But yeah, that's how I felt when I went there. I loved visiting. I was ready to get out of there after 10 days. So um, yeah. the expensiveness, the traffic, the, you know, it, it was weird when I was out there. Like everything shut down at like 11 o'clock on a Saturday night down the strip. I was like, what the hell? I heard all this crazy stuff from the 80s and it's nothing like that. But Anyways, moving on, because I don't want to keep you so much longer. Um, this is the first album that you, you painted the cover for, um, which is kind of surprising that you didn't use your artwork before. Did you just feel like there wasn't a, a statement you wanted to make until this album? Or what what, what manifested it's that? It's complicated. Like, I, I still don't even know if I like that cover. Like I, oh, I do. I'm a lot harder on myself with the visual art, and I, like, because of... I have high standards for because of the amount of training. And so right. I think I did do like the Photoshop on ballads of living and dying and like a lot, I did a lot of the graphic stuff on some of these. Um, but yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, it's really open for interpretation was because it looks like a forest or city burning. It looks like the Aurora Borealis. It's just very abstract, but it's super cool. I love that album cover. Cool. So, don't overthink that. Um, <laughs> you toured really extensively and had Milky with you. And uh, I believe, did you have a cellist with you too for a little while? Um, I had a cellist named Janelle that I played with for a while. But yeah. live, did did? Yeah, did she, she play? played live on um, up to a point, and then um, went to work on her own stuff. 
Yeah, uh, she wasn't with you in Philly when I saw you. Um, yeah. But uh, so many killer tracks. Are you really going to move to the south? So beautiful. Longing vocal lines. You're only harmless when you sleep. <laughs> Man, is that song so cool. That song is so cool. The lyrics are fucking super cool. Sorry. I usually say a lot more ass. I'm being respectful. So um, 2019, you team up with Stephen Brodsky of Cave In, Converge to record the Cola Lab album, Drone Flower. Yeah. How'd that come about? You knew him, obviously. Yeah, but. we're friends. He's another Massachusetts kid. And um, we met at St. Vitus, that cool Brooklyn metal oh, yeah. band. Um, yeah. I threw, he, we just like our friends and thought it would be cool to collaborate. And and it was cool to collaborate with somebody from such a different set of influences. Like, mm -hmm. he, I'm really not like somebody that's that, that, that's that well versed in metal. Right, right. Surprisingly, um, for like what scene I've been kind of like. Um, You've been associated with it weirdly because of the disaster thing, really. The disaster thing was what did it. I yep. mean, when you yep. sing on a songs like on a record like that, it sticks. So yeah, I, I remember seeing that, and I'm like, "What the fuck, huh?" And then I got the I have the record, but yeah. you're right. You're kind of buried. You're another instrument in the mix, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Was, uh, he's he's the real deal. He's like a pretty um, in, yeah, interesting guy. Pretty, so, pretty uh, misanthropic sort of kind of. Yeah, it's definitely not an act. Let's yeah. say that. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah, there's a couple of those guys, like Jeff Whitehead from Leviathan. He's he's not a guy that likes a lot of people. <laughs> and I get that sometimes. I'm one of those guys, um, although I'm really not. But you guys did In the Air at Night. Uh, you did More Than Words, which is fucking great. And I don't like Extreme. I like Nuno, but I don't like Extreme. But that song, killer, so killer. Um I'll let you speak in a second. I just want to get it out of the way. Um, man, it's, the vocal harmonies, wicked as fuck. They're so good. Just so good. Um, clearly, the centerpiece of this album is your your take on GNR's Strained. It is, <laughs> man, it's so cool. I'm not a huge GNR guy, even though I was back in the day. I just kind of don't feel it anymore, and I really don't like Axel's voice anymore. But that song might be my favorite from the Use Your Illusion thing. Was it your idea to do that or him or? I think it was mine. I'm pretty sure. Well, I know it's been one of my favorite songs ever since high school. Like the mm -hmm. video with Axel and the Dolphins. And I was a huge Guns N' Roses fan. Like all the ballads. November oh, yeah. 19 and Don't Cry, Patience. Patience, and yeah. I'm I'm a sucker for a good. Is that, ballad. The, only, is that the only GNR you've done? You've covered? Yeah. Well, we yeah. I've tried to do "Don't Cry," but it's not in my vocal range. Yeah, I don't hear that one from you. It's it and might I, be a little I, too. No, and I've tried to do "Patience" um, with Brodsky, but it just wasn't feeling right. With the strange, we almost gave up a lot of times because <laughs> it's so long, but we really pushed through it. And it's so cool. It's so cool. Um, and this album is very dark, doomy, dreary, bleak musically, yet it's very ethereal and layered with lots of prettiness. Mostly do your vocal treatments, snaking in and around the musical constructs. Um, For the Sun, for example, could be a horror movie soundtrack song. It's so cool. Dead West also has a very cinematic feel, like a spaghetti western type thing. Um, clearly, like I said, it, just killer. July 2020, you released a cool ambient soundscaping mini lp called moons that of course was like heroin for me because i love ambient stuff and it was like you and milky did that i believe right yeah it's beautiful um you know i know you've really been into ambient music a lot lately and why wouldn't you be but you know, i have a million suggestions for you on that so i'll i'll hit you up with those um on earth one and two Bandcamp, March and August of 2020. These are essentially for my crime strangers demos, outtakes, and session tracks. Anything you wanted to say about those? I think that they're worth delving into for people that like lo-fi and demos. Um, you know, are they, I happen to like lo-fi music. But they're, they're digital though, right? You did that all that on digital? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think it's worth noting real quick before we wrap this up. Uh, Marissa has a ton of stuff on her band camp. 
and that is a direct way to support her. The funds, most of the funds go directly to her. There is cover, there's covers albums that we just couldn't get into, or we would have been here five hours instead of three and a half almost, or I'm sorry, two and a half. Um, and there are outtakes, demos. You got to get on those, man. They're cheap. They're only five or six bucks, seven at the most. That's like the cost of a Frappuccino, guys. Go buy this stuff. Um, I think, yeah, close to finishing up. Path of the Clouds released October 29th, 2021. An album written and worked on during the pandemic based on storytelling that focuses on universal stories of murder, love, fantasy, emotional struggles. So apparently you were binging on Unsolved Mysteries, which you said to Maddie when we were talking. and. Yeah. You came out of it in 48 hours. I heard you mention 48 hours. I love that show, uh, or did love it when it was on. But you come out telling these stories about wives killing their husbands, possibly, D.B. Cooper jumping from a plane, being an accomplice to a killer, the Anglin brothers escaping from Alcatraz. Man, you just, like, went all over the place. And the crazy thing is, they all work. The first five tracks are insanely good on this album. They're just, your songwriting just keeps going. And I, I'm not blowing smoke here i really don't you know i think you can see my excitement you just keep upping the ante marissa and i keep going when is she gonna just choke and fall <laughs> and yeah. i don't see it happening i don't see it happening um what that's do you want to say about nice. this album uh that's sweet of you to say i i'm a hard worker and this record um milky worked really hard on as well and and it was just a, like because of the pandemic, we, there was more time to get it right. And right. I also, by that time, had learned Pro Tools and recorded a lot more of the demos. Um, and also, you produced you produced this album, right? Yeah, I, I mean, and, and Milky had a lot of production input. I guess it was like a co thing. Um, co producer, yeah. Who mixed it? Uh, was it somebody named Manchester or my yeah. Seth Manchester mixed it? Um, yeah. It was recorded in Nashville, uh, all like at both at home and in this studio called Club Roar with our friend Jesse, who did some great um, engineering, Jesse Newport. And then uh, he helped me get the tracks ready to send to Seth Manchester and Providence, who I've known for years. And mm -hmm. he's worked with like Lingua Ignota. And um, he, is, he, I, is he the guy that's in Mercury Rev or no? No. Um, okay. Seth Manchester is just mixed it. And um, that's Jess Chandler. My bad. Sorry. Jesse Chandler um, right. played a lot of the woodwinds and some of the keyboard and piano and. Is a wonderful musician um, as well. There's a lot of great contributors to yeah, this. Yeah, I was going to say, mention some of those names, because some of them, one of them in particular is pretty big. Oh, yeah. Simon Ramon. He, yeah. yeah. That little guy. Yeah, no. That, he, that dude, he, yeah. Um, my, we're, at this point, we've collaborated as writing partners on several songs for his project, Lost Horizons. Um but it was like a real dream come true to I've checked that out. work that with a cool. Cocteau twin. And he happens to run Bella Union as well. So oh, oh, I didn't know that. Okay, there you go. That makes sense then, right. But he right. like even played, he came into the BBC with Milky and Monica. Um, and Monica's in a project called Nordra and uh, played bass on the BBC. Like he stands behind his artist in a way that few... Um, He's a really good guy and cool. nothing but good things to say about him. Love is, is bass tone. His bass tone's killer too, man. Totally. You can, you can always tell his bass tone. And the cure, man, right up there with Bowie. There and I forgot to mention you did a cover of my absolute favorite cure song, probably one of yours too, clearly. The a forest. God, I love that song. It is the coolest song ever, man. Um, I should redo that cover though. Like I didn't know what I was doing with recording at the time. Like my, there was a real learning curve. Now I'm like fading like a master. I'm chopping. All right. Up, but it took me a long time to get to that point. So you're like George Martin in the studio now. Is that what yeah, you're saying? Right. Exactly. <laughs> um, did, did, you didn't really tour on this one though because of the pandemic, right? Did you get did, until but... later, till just this year, right? 
Unfortunately, we, I had to wait until um, recently. Yeah. Like the tours for this record were recently. Um, so we, Milky and I went on tour for this record. Um, and I had a woman named Monica and um, yeah. Who was playing was, drums? You had a drummer too, right? Yeah, uh, we had a Don McGreevy play drums for the U.S. part of the tour, and then uh, for Europe, it just wasn't economically feasible to bring mm -hmm. a drummer. So we, I, we played to tracks you played from tracks. the actual record. But oh my God, you played to tracks. Eddie Trunk is going to be so mad. Just kidding. Um, you probably don't even know what I'm. I didn't about. want to, but it, sometimes you just have to. Like it was that or play. Like I didn't want to no. play the songs without a beat. You know. Well, the tracks are. There's a real good bed of rhythm on this with the drums, so you you it would it would sound stripped down, but it probably wouldn't sound like you wanted it to sound. Um, obvious standout tracks, Bessie. Oh my God, that just why do you do this to me? You you put that song on there, and I got to go. Well, that's my favorite song now. So just a beautiful song. Couldn't have done the killing. Ah, oh, come on, man. If I could breathe underwater, that's a really cool tune. That has a uniqueness to it that's not. Mm -hmm sort of your normal sound um i think we're pretty much yeah that's like the that record in july are tied for me in my in terms of favorites for different reasons Beautiful. but like if for people that haven't heard the new one yet i would say please check it out because oh. i wish i could have toured it more you know i'm gonna be going on some solo dates up the east coast uh are you coming to philly or baltimore Yes. Um, I think I'm going to do a tiny show in Philly. Um, and I'll let you know when that. Yeah, you got to let me know because confirm soon. I'll need, I'll need to uh, get a driver because I can't drive, but I'm coming down uh, yeah. for sure. Um, real quick. Oh, I wanted to tell you, I know three people that I personally forced to buy Path of the Clouds. Oh, cool. Three of my good buddies that we do our YouTube stuff and collaborations on, they're like, dude, this shit's fucking killer, man. <laughs> so there you go. There's three I know I sold personally. Thank um, you. What else do we have here real quick? Uh, last, More or less the last thing, Wrath of the Clouds, which I missed this too. I don't know how, but uh, it came out on February 4th, 22. It's an EP of non-album tracks. Uh, non-album? Yeah, non-album tracks from the past sessions and two covers. One's a reinterpretation of the song that you did 12 years ago. Uh, help me out. Saunders Ferry Lane. Saunders Ferry Lane by Sammy Smith. Smith. And the, the remake is really awesome. The original yeah. is really good, too. I mean, your original, it's really good. but No, it's terrible. But, uh, um, I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> the new it's version, so Milky plays on it, and it's yeah. like drums. And, yep. It's, um, it's, it's great, Marissa. Um, better vibe. I have to ask this question, and I already, you know what's coming here. Guns I in the Sun Deck was too long. When you exceed 44 minutes or something, you you can no longer make, like, a there's a limit. Album. And I, it oh. was between making, like, a weaker double record oh, okay. or a really strong singular record. And that record, that song made it too long. So I agree that it belongs with the song. So I, I'm telling you, that is... Okay, I'm going to do it again. That's my favorite Marissa <laughs> song. I'm I'm just, the okay. It is so incredible. The The lyrics, if I screwed them up here, because I couldn't, there's none online. Many came from afar and wide just to glimpse the cross in the tide. I miss the ocean. She said it's nice. She said it's nice in the sun, but I need a break from the dead, from the dead people. Man, that those lines are so wickedly badass. They're just so cool. What what and I know it was about the sinking of the Queen Mary, right? Or That's, like the chorus is in the point of view of the Queen Mary ship. Ah, yes, and all the dead people are in in her. Exactly. Oh, it's so cool! So I it's love this song. Out, out there song, but like this was one of those ones where I was like, okay, I'm. I want to write about like because sometimes you can write a heartbreak song or a revenge song that rings true to your own experiences while speaking about somebody else's story. And that's like what made Bessie resonate with people. I think oh, was yeah. because there's plenty of people that can relate to dreaming of escaping or even worse. Um, yeah. 
you yeah. know so yes i yes i've never felt homicidal with a partner but me neither i've had a lot of really bad feelings that you know i've been <laughs> i've been single now for well forever but a lot of it is because i had you know a bad relationship seven years ago that pretty much wrecked me entirely because i thought i was going to be with this woman for the rest of my life and it really was devastating to find out she had planned something a complete new transition by my back so when i hear things that remind me of that man as much as i've moved on from it it still stings you know it always will yeah. um that song i'm going to say it one last time and then we're going to go real okay. quickly guns on the sun deck holy shit, what a song tour de force musically lyrically um man i don't even know i don't even know what to say it's just so good um as one reviewer on Rate Your Music says, Blair23, what does one say about a five-song EP from Miss Nather? What does one say that's creatively new? It's the same gloriously melancholic, beautiful, echoey, hauntingly sensual, hypnotically evocative listening experience. Listen to it when you're high. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was killer. Now, I have not done that. I do smoke every now and again, rarely, but every now and again. And I may try that, quite frankly. It helps with my pain a lot. Um yeah. The two covers are incredible. There was Saunders Ferry Lane is seductively lush. The Alessi Brothers, Seabird. What a cool little tune, man. It's like, and how I missed that in the 70s. I don't remember this song. How did you run into that? I was used in the, the movie um, Wilder Hunt for the Wilder Beast or People. Or anyway, I heard the song and immediately it was like, what a cool song. It's so yeah. catchy. Um, so actually, cool. Yeah, I was really uh, happy with the way that came out, and it's the fastest song I've ever sung, so it might bode well for the... Uh, Here's a question for you, because we're almost done, I promise. I got two last things. Do you Have you been contacted by any of the artists that covered you that said, hey, I love your cover, or... Uh, actually, the Alessi, one of the Alessi brothers wrote on that uh, YouTube that he liked the cover a lot. Um, no way. Yeah, um, I think that that's it, because uh, most okay. of the people are dead. Um, <laughs> well, Danzig's not dead. He kind of looks it, but I mean, you know. No, so that cover, <laughs> um, no, I haven't, I think I'm still too cult. For okay, them. Yeah. one more cover comment. Um Ordinary world. Oh, I've oh I've wow. already done that one. No, I know you did. Oh yeah. This is my comment on it. Holy balls. Pardon my French. It is so fucking amazing. It's just amazing. It's amazing. All right. Um maybe what's during going on lately? Like it reach out. Yeah. What's going on lately? What what's happening? You said you're gonna do a short run of solo stuff. What's in the works as an album, new material, uh, internet drops? What's what's going on? Well, yeah, I'm going to start practicing for a little solo tour. Um, and I've been I'm doing some ambient music. So I started a Patreon thing just because. Oh, shit, that's right. Friends were telling me, like, peers of mine have them and I, I was like why not just try it out and so that's been kind of cool because it's forcing me to like to keep Do something um, yeah like forcing me to that are paying you for your creativity it's an interesting thing it's not really like a crowdfunding kind of thing it's more like right. old-fashioned patron of the arts kind of thing like yep. um, and if somebody's saying hey I got five bucks I want to give it to you. You give me something in return down the road, whatever it is. If it's just, you know, a two-minute ambient track or an acoustic track. How's, how have you done so far? I'm going to admit I'm not a patron. Yeah. I will be, but oh, I don't worry about it. It's no, no, I just want to explain. I just want to explain. I am trying desperately to get disability, and it's been a real battle. Oh, I, so, I don't. So please don't get my Patreon. No, <laughs> I, no, no. But I would love to be a it's Patreon. It's more like, like a, um, it's just something I'm trying out, like just because I have several friends and label mates that have them, and it kind of seemed like, well, it seems to be working. Why not? Right? Why, Why not? not give it a shot. Yeah. It gives um, like mega listeners or fans uh, some exclusive content or like first um. So I've already put up like some stuff on there and that's been fun. I'm teaching lessons. I teach 
songwriting lessons. Oh. Yep. Um, well, I think you might have a patron in Maddie. I'll check with her and we'll set something up. I think. I, yeah, I, I do either one-offs or um, I've got several weekly or monthly students, all different styles of music, and I teach fine art as well on Zoom. So that's kind of like my day job. Like, is, is there a new album percolating or like maybe? um sort of kind of? Yeah, I mean, I I think I've almost just recently started writing again. Actually, awesome. So, um, I that last one is a hard one to follow up, and you're, I'm at this point now where it's like, oh wow, it's a lot of records. Like any record I do from here on, it has to be like remarkably different, or, you wanna, or something. You can't keep treading the same path. So. Do you want to hear the last comment I say here? Yes. How do you top path? Because I'm pretty certain you will. I hope. I mean, I, I have no doubt that I will with something. I mean, I'm we're also working on a body of fine art. I'm going to work towards gallery representation. But, like, in terms of topping that, it's got to be different. Like, July and the Path of the Clouds are really different. Right, they are, very much. Like, maybe I'll get into beats. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. No, I'm not, I'm just... I like the ambient idea. You know what I think you should do, though? what get some corpse paint get some spiked gauntlets and just go full-on black metal just take <laughs> a black metal raging album with that scream that you're working on oh yeah and it will sell millions especially here's the deal if you do it real cult style kv whatever it is k-u-v-l-t or whatever they they spell it with you will sell those like hotcakes you'll make the first hundred exclusive you make the next a thousand exclusive and that's how these guys do it it's really funny but um last thing marissa and i i cannot thank you enough for all your time and i know you're wearing out but <laughs> i wanted to ask you in the spirit of women women's empowerment i want to ask you just to give a quick thought about each of the the artists i'm going to name if you don't know them just say pass i don't know them. linda perhox we kind of talked about i love her <laughs> and you have parallelogram right or um yeah yeah. Yep. Yeah. The album. Just Chicago uh, Rain is the pretty song. Oh, Chiba Come Rain. Yeah. Um, and Parallelogram is so haunting and trippy. You know what I mean? How about Judy Sill? I love Judy Sill. Um, I covered one of her songs for. That's what I thought. Um, yeah. A tribute record. Which one was that? Do you remember? The Kiss. Ah, I've not heard that song. We'll check that out. Uh, Joni Mitchell, we already talked about a lot. You're a way bigger fan of Joni Mitchell than the aforementioned other women. I mean, Joni Mitchell to me, she I'm not comparing queen. women. I'm just, she is like, a, the queen. she's the queen yeah. for me of, um, as an innovator on the guitar and just as a groundbreaker, she's really important to me as a writer. Here's a couple other ones. Kate Bush. I love Kate Bush. I got into her later. Um, so did I. Hounds of Love great yeah so good running up that hill i mean can you is there a cooler trippier 80s track than that i don't know uh chelsea wolf i love chelsea wolf i don't Where, know her. Um, i need to check her out did she uh, she played she, on one of your albums right no um that, oh, wait. she doesn't oh, that was emma ruth emma ruth i'm sorry emma ruth rundle yeah. uh i know both of them quite um they're both real sweet and I, as I said, I'm a big proponent of women supporting each other's music. Um, How about Beth Hart? Beth Hart. Mm -hmm. I'm drawing a blank right now. Check her out. Stunning voice. Uh, bluesy. Man, you want to talk about raw emotion? Wow. Check her out. Um, you may not know this one either. Holly Henderson? I don't. Um, Holly Henderson, check out the song. Oh, crap. Hold on. My daughter, would. she introduced me to her. Look, something about war. Um, before the war or after the war, I think it's called. Stunningly beautiful track. Just amazing. Uh, a couple more. Joan Baez. I, I know she, um, she has a beautiful voice. Diamonds and Rust, right? I, I, she's not an influence of mine, though. How about Sandy Denny? From Fairport. Yeah. Um, beautiful voice. All right. Last two. 
Liz Fraser. Um, yeah, very, uh, you know, the Cocteau Twins were not like a, a band that I listened to until later when I was cool. Like yeah. I was in <laughs> Right, 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 right. Because it wasn't quite my era, so I had to discover them. At you had to go back, right. Yeah. Funny thing is, I was in high school when that was coming out, but I had discovered Judas Priest and Iron Maiden, so I was kind of, don't get me wrong, there's so many great 80s bands, Depeche Mode, Fear, Tears for Fears, you could go on and on and on. Uh, but uh, last one, Lisa Gerard, this album right here. I've actually been meaning to check her music out, so I will. Uh, you need to check out this album, Marissa. It is. I, I want to get it right because I always. Uh, damn it! Can't read my own. Can't read it. Wow! I can't believe we've been talking for almost three hours. But this is like, this is its only kind. I've never done an interview thing like this. So within the realm of the of a dying sun, check this okay. out. I am so sorry. I monopolized your whole day. <laughs> It's um, totally fine. I I'm going to hit you up with a Patreon. I'll steal my dad's car. Please don't do that. I will be mad. I don't want you to do that. I only mentioned it for people that are maybe. No, I know. Watching. I know. I feel like I owe you for all this time. You do vampire. not owe me anything. It's actually a pleasure to, to meet you and to do the interview with somebody that really uh, paid so much attention. So I appreciate it. Well, you know. I met you before. We did meet after the show, but I was kind yeah, of... I do actually remember. I thought... I didn't have this long hair, though. I had buzzed hair. Okay. So, but we did talk because I brought up Stephen Wilson, and you were like, oh, yeah, I kind of remember. Because we had some emails way back in, like, 2004. It was I was trying to get you hooked up with him to do, like, a duo thing. It was okay. kind of weird. Um, so, yeah, everybody go out. Get <sighs> I, I forgot to show all your... Your album covers. I'll do that after you go off. I'll I'll, I'll let you go. Um, go out and buy Marissa stuff. You won't be disappointed. Support her. Go to Bandcamp. If you can't go to Bandcamp, go to your distro. But I'm telling you, she's kind of. I don't want to say you're one of a kind, but you're pretty much one of a kind. So. You're so, sweet. <laughs> so all right. Everybody's one of a kind. Okay. I'll thank you so much. And oh, yeah. I've got to run. So I'll. I'll catch up on the thing and I'll yeah, do that. And let me know when do you think the tour is going to go? Do you have any idea? Late uh, eight, April twenty second. Okay, then I will. Um, I will do everything in my power to mm -hmm. make it down to say hello and hang out and watch you guys. So okay. Okay. All right. Um, all right. I'll I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, okay. Marissa. Thanks a lot. I'm gonna I'm gonna show everybody your album covers quick and do a sign off. So, muchas gracias. Okay. Donata. Okay. okay. Thanks, dear. Bye-bye. All, right. All right. That was, uh, I think she probably wasn't expecting that, but, um, you know, that's what I do here. Uh, super cool. Uh, anybody that was hanging out, I didn't really get into comments. I apologize. Uh, don't forget another Bandcamp Friday's coming up. Yeah. Bandcamp Friday's coming up. Jake is one of the guys I talked into uh, doing this. Mom, you miss most. Yeah, it's gonna, you're going to have to catch up. Yeah, I'm sorry, dude. I totally forgot. I was in private chat and I forgot to uh, to uh, show comments. Been watching the last 30 minutes. Go check it. Yeah, go check it. I had to kind of hurry the last 30 minutes because she had a student, I think, at uh, five o'clock. So I was eating into her time really, really bad. Um, we had some problems at the beginning. There's the first. We we didn't get on until about 15 minutes late. So stunning artist. Go buy her stuff. You won't regret it. Start with the last album because it's absolutely amazing. And um, I'll show you those real quick. We were at, I don't know where we were at. Let me look quick here. Oh, we were close. So here's Strangers. This is 16. And that's a fucking amazing album. Uh, here is the... Collaboration she did with, oh no, this is For My Crimes from 2018. Absolutely amazing, amazing, amazing album. Uh, I would also say that's a great place to start. Jake, I think you'd love this album if you didn't get it. Uh, where are we at here? Well, two more to show. Uh, where are we at? Tour? 
oh yeah, I fucked up. I got so excited, I kind of goofed. This is the uh, Stephen Brodsky uh, drone flower, Marissa Nadler collaboration, also on Sacred Bones. It's really cool. It's only thirty five minutes. It's very cinematic. It's very um, dark, and yet super shimmery and beautiful. Super damn cool. Super damn cool. Uh, and then one, two more. We have. I feel bad. I did this. I just really goofed. Here we have the Path of the Clouds, her latest full album, which is just man, it is mind blowing. Jake, I don't know if you're still in there. You're probably not, but <clears throat> you can attest to how stunning this album is, especially the first five or six tracks. They're just mind blowers. And the last one is an EP that she put out early in 2022 called The Wrath of the Clouds. And it is, I'm telling you right now, it is worth getting simply, simply for the opening track, Guns on the Sun Deck. Oh, my God. I've said it a million times. That's my favorite song. That's my favorite song. No, this is my favorite song. Guns on the Sun Deck blew my mind. It is so fucking good. Um, so good. So um, to any Marissa Nadler fans who are coming and watching this later, I apologize for the F-bombs. But as I get tired, I tend to go that way. I did really good most of the interview. So want to thank Marissa for nearly three hours of her time today. Uh, she was absolutely amazing. Love her work. Just a sweetheart of a person. She... My daughter, if you guys didn't see, my daughter came on and, um, you know, Maddie came on. She talked to her for about 15, 20 minutes. So cool to hear them talking about creating music because my daughter, you know, is, is just really on her path to ascend. And a lot of you have heard one of her tracks. and It's amazing. But again, back to Marissa, such a stunning artist. She's wonderful. Thank you, Marissa, if you watch this. And, uh, yeah, my voice is, despite all the fluid, my... Uh, Shogun's syndrome is kicking my butt right now. So I'm going to end this. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I think I did a good job. And I think Marissa did was a trooper and a warrior. And she did an amazing job. Thanks again, Marissa. Okay, bye. See ya. Oh, don't forget. Saturday night, 8 o'clock. Myself, Eli from Hymns of the... Oh, I can never remember his name. Hymns from the Great White North, I think it is. Uh, and Lee from Lee, literal Lee, uh, are going to join me. And we're going to do the uh, King Crimson uh, catalog. And then on Sunday at 10 p.m., my time, it might be 9, but I got to check. I think it's 10. Dennis and I are doing our fourth installment of the Forgotten Metal Gems of the 80s and 90s. We're doing Hardline. We're doing Madam X. We're doing HSAS. We're doing Last Crack. We're doing Michael Shanker Group. One more, I'm forgetting. Odin and Odin. Lots to listen to. I got to tune out, guys. See ya.